now received a disclaimed audit outcome for the third consecutive year with irregular in expenditure increasing to 3.2 billion rands, fruitless and wasteful expenditure increased to 169 million rands. The 1920 financial uh, annual financial report reflected dire and deteriorating financial situation and revenue had fallen by 20% to 2.7 billion rands and the loss of 1.9 billion rands. Insolvent with a debt position of 3.4 billion rands as of 31 March 2020. We were briefed as a committee by National Treasury on SOE bailouts on government guarantees on the 14th of March 2023, and Tenel had received almost 9 billion rands in the past five financial years. The Minister of Public Enterprises confirmed in Parliament that government had provided over 233.6 billion rands in bailouts to SOEs over the last five years and has not received any dividends from these SOEs except for one million rands from SAFCOL. So that's the position when we last met. The latest tabled annual report was for 1920, and Daniel, as I indicated, had received a disclaimed audit outcome, which was the third one. Amongst others, the AG identified significant weaknesses in internal controls as the main driver for the disclaimed audit outcome. In the absence of strong internal control environment, management was unable to produce credible financial statements. The annual reports for the 2021 and 2122 have not been tabled. Danel did not timely submit the AFS for audit. The delays in the submission of the AFS for auditing was due to the continued operational insolvency challenges, including the exodus of critical skills. The latest available audited financial statements on our records are 1920. And then there's a long list of issues that the AG has highlighted, including, as I've already said, the accumulation on the balance of irregular expenditure from 2.9 billion to 3.2 billion. And amongst others, the AG indicates that there are contraventions with deviations, expansions, valuation of criteria not adequately applied, bids not adequately approved, contracts not signed, declaration of interest and in tax clearance, and so on. So we are this morning then on that background to receive an update and a progress report on those issues, which I have highlighted. So I'm saying that is how things stand and we will get a briefing this morning then in terms of where we are. So what I'll do is we'll hand over to the Deputy Minister if there's any remarks that he would like to make and then hand over to the Chairperson of the Board to take us through all the issues and she will delegate as she deems fit in the team that uh, she has brought. DM, um, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. And uh, morning and greetings to honorable members uh, of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts and to the Chairperson of the board and other board members present of DINEL and the management of DINEL and also from the SIU represented here by Advocate Mutim. Uh, Chair, I'm not going to be too long because now today the board is here uh, to do the fiduciary accountability and obviously as you said they will then hand over to the management to then present the report at the time. The the last appearance was a difficult, the Dinel was in a very, very difficult situation and, uh, and I think you have alluded to some of the issues as you were, were doing your opinion remarks. And in 2021, uh, that was the situation. And, and obviously today we are going to be giving an update, as you said, uh, on what have we done or the, the Dinel is doing. Uh, from the shareholder point of view, we see progress the turnaround strategy which has been finally adopted and also up, uh, 
supported by the shareholder, uh, is beginning to yield some results, slowly but definitely going in the right direction. And I think uh, the report will then articulate on that turnaround strategy and, uh, and, and it will also engage on those li liquidity and insolvency matters. The audit reports will also indicate what is it and then what are we doing. And uh, so with that, Chair, I just want to say the situation is really improving and, and it's Dinelli is going in the right direction. There's confidence in it. Its IP is still one of the best globally. It's still sought after even though we had lost some of it to some countries because of the, 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 the personnel that left Dinel out of 161 uh, professionals, engineers, uh, almost 100 is gone to other countries, to private sector, and uh, they've left with their skills and they are now enhancing uh, those countries, uh, which will be mentioned later in the report it themselves. So with that, Chair, we, we hope therefore that uh, we, we will then give a better report as is. And maybe then to clarify as in my last comment, in 2021, the chairperson was not the current chairperson. Yes, he was, she was part of the board. And in the last meeting, they were slashing that be a chairperson as intolerant, as arrogant as that, but I don't tell you that the current chair is not what was described. And, and, and when the current chair presents now, you will then see that is a different woman, not the other woman. Thank you very much, chair. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, DM. I just want to stress uh, before the chair takes to the floor that the boards are the accounting authorities of institutions. And so that there's clarity as to why we did not proceed last week is that in the absence of accounting authorities, then it is pointless for us to engage. That is simply the alpha and omega of the SOP. Otherwise, if we begin exercising latitude, we are opening a floodgate and setting a precedence that will not be sustainable. So that is precisely the, the nub of it. Um, so Madam Chair, um, over to DM, but you will have to tell us because the interim board that was announced, there have been changes. So it was interesting because last week I had to field questions about why the chair is not the chair. And I said, go to DPE. It's not my matter. Because I made reference to one chair corresponding with us, and they said, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, <clears throat> DPE, you will still need to explain why the chair you appointed in a matter of days and weeks is no longer the chair, what happened there, because that's not our matter. So I just thought I should bring that to your attention. Our media officer will tell you, just, I was like, I don't know. The meeting didn't proceed, so we don't know. So there's also uh, that matter, right? Uh, Madam Chair, over to you. Thank you, uh, Chairman. The, um, my name is Gloria Serobe. Uh, Currently, I'm the chairman of the board, and and one has exercised that chairmanship in as if it's, there's no questions about it. So um, and so, I take full responsibility for everything uh, that happens in this board. So that is why I had to make that call last week, and and take ownership of what seems to have irritated this committee about the board not uh, being here. I need to emphasize, Chairman, that the, as a board of Danel, we have never missed a meeting here, not at all, uh, until uh, last week. Um, as you have mentioned, the Chairman, the scheduling became an issue 
in terms of we got the notice late and I was traveling immediately after that. And so my letter did say that uh, the best endeavors uh, to check with the rest of the board members if they can attend the meeting. It was not to be because even for them, it was seriously very late notice. I think we got the notice on Friday and the meeting was on Wednesday and the physical nature of the meeting that they must come to Cape Town is what made it a problem. And one of those board members, uh, General Matanzima, is not well. Uh, that's another uh, thing. So I must apologize again uh, for last week, just to emphasize that as a, as a board of an SOE, we understand how important this committee is. And we have given it all the respect uh, possible, and there's no intention uh, to do otherwise. Uh, needless to say that the, the impression could also be that we are disrespectful of, of uh, DPE, our department. I need to also emphasize that we've got a huge respect for DPE and all the committees uh, related to, to Parliament. So I just want to give you that assurance. It was just not practical for the board to be here uh, last week. And I need to apologize for that again. Um, if I can then come to the presentation, is to say that, in fact, this is the one time we come with a big progress. We've come with a big positive report uh, to this committee. We've been here when we were in serious trouble. Uh, we are at that time where we think that it's one of those SOEs that might show the way, in fact, about how to get out of trouble. And we have given a lot uh, to make that work. Um, we have put in front of the committee and DPE and Treasury the turnaround plan. And the reason they could find bef behind it was because it is a practical turnaround plan. Uh, it is not full of, uh, of fluffy things. Um, we do have a financial issue at Denel. And we have concentrated on that uh, in the last two to three years uh, to change that. In the process, we got into trouble, uh, including with people and not being able to pay salaries and lose the staff and employees. We are cleaning that up again. Um, even as we're doing that, we're mindful of the fact that because Denel is a prestigious uh, entity with all these very bright people. And so when the whole world is looking for top engineering skills, they look here. Mm. And we are no different in terms of that. We don't have the high dollar salaries. So the world will come here and take them. We're mindful of that. Except we, we have to be always aware that the pipeline uh, we build our own timber, if I were to put it that way. That uh, we now understand that we will, be, because we are the leaders in the world, in some of the areas, and those we have big balance sheets will come here and source skills. So it's a risk that we, we pretty much are aware of that. Uh, on terms of the board, um, I'm quite comfortable that you can't have a better board than this in terms of the mixture of the skills, hardcore skills. That's what we've got. Uh, we may need one or two engineers into the board. Uh, having said that, our group CEO, who is a board member, is an engineer. And therefore, we're not completely lacking on the engineering uh, skills. But we need to add maybe one or two non-executive board members. As a, as a hardcore engineering and, and production skills. But currently, the board we've got is a strong mixture of skills, especially for what we're trying to deal with. You've got the legal skills, you've got the CAs in this board. That's why we have uh, augmented it. Um, on the issue of the CEO and the uh, CFO, both are acting at this point. And now that we're in a better, healthy uh, condition, 
the process to source the, the CEO and the CFO has actually started. What would happen before we could fix all these things? You wouldn't get a good candidates responding to the program of sourcing the CEOs and the CFO skills. So the board committee is busy with that, and that is in progress. The last point I wanted to mention is that we support the Zondo Commission and everything that comes with it. We have a process in terms of how we're dealing with that. It's the same thing with the SIU. Um, just to say one more thing around the SIU chairman, none of the board members are a subject of the SIU investigations. That also includes the CEO and the CFO. None of the board members are a subject of that. I stress on that because we have to assure SIU that we will give them undiluted support. Uh, we will not interfere uh, with the exercise of the SIU. We will do everything to make it work uh, for SIU. And where we have to implement something, we will definitely do that. We are in touch uh, with the SIU. We do talk to them quite frequently. And we can only respect that uh, investigation unit because that's what we also want to do, to do, and that we have to clean up all these uh, things. So um, Advocate Motibi knows that he's got our full support, and there is no complication about them, their work being uh, frustrated. <coughs> if it is fine, Chairman, I can end there uh, and maybe hand over to uh, the CEO and the CFO to do their presentations, unless there are questions that I have to, I have to take. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think we'll go straight to the presentation. Only comment is DM and the Ministry. Please. Timiest communication of parliamentary correspondence to the boards. Yeah. <clears throat> because you see, if that... See, because I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we dispatched it timiestly. Right? But if they receive it, they then bear the brutal brunt of the committee. And we've discussed this thing ad nauseum with DPE, including on ESCOM, so on and so forth. That whilst your protocols request that we communicate with yourselves, it is incumbent on you to make sure that it reaches. Otherwise, DM um, and the department, if this persists, I want to put it on record, we will bypass you and go straight to the boards and the entities directly. On the basis of, it can't be that then the board would have received the letter on the Friday when it was timelessly dispatched. This is not to bail out the board, but I think our own protocols need to be improved about the timeless transmission of correspondence. So I just thought I should flag it because it's a matter that has arisen before and we were given the assurances that it was resolved. Now we had to postpone a meeting last week and we put it that the board must explain why they shouldn't bear the personal cost, rather bear the cost personally for that meeting being postponed. Now seated here the board says we were told late and our records indicate that the people whom we must speak to, which is DPE, we inform them timelessly. So it creates a problem. It creates a fundamental problem. So in the event that this persists, we will have no other option other than to communicate directly with the boards. And I don't think that's desirable in terms of uh, the memorandum of understanding that DPE has with as the shareholder representative that you have with the SOEs. So I just, it goes now, then the question remains, who pays these costs? SIU was here, you were here, we were here. That question remains. The board is saying, Tina, we were told late. So, Bob Somio. No, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson, colleagues, uh, the Deputy Minister, the Chairperson, the Chairman of the board. 
<laughs> the head of SIU uh, and, the, and the team. <clears throat> yes, indeed, uh, Chair. Um, the, the, the only sticky uh, area uh, on, the, on the apology which the Chair uh, of the Board um, had, had, had did forward uh, to yourself, uh, noting her absence, uh, which in, in that instance we dealt with, the absence of the board has been viewed in line of the commitment by the chairman when uh, she wrote to the board that other members of the board will be present. Uh, so, so, so it should not appear as if uh, we are chasing shadows when it comes to that point. Uh, that, that commitment uh, is a sticky one, uh, which um, required uh, some sense of accountability. Uh, for, such a, for such absence. The second area for me is that um, uh, indeed I accept that the, the board has, has never failed to be part of, of, of our meetings. Um, but I note uh, the interim nature of the board has been a bit uh, per perpetual. Uh, um, something which uh, probably we need to check uh, on, uh, Honorable Chairperson. And even more in line with the fact that the CEO is acting, the CFO is acting, and, and the board is, is interim, interim, interim. So the appointments are, are, are not necessarily um, a finding a solid base uh, for the prescribed time uh, of appointment of a board. Um, uh, in line of the statutes. I don't know why, why, why is that the case? Um, why is that the case? Uh, I, 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 I think that uh, they, they, the chair here has been part of a board which was interim and is still part of the board which is still termed interim. Why is that the case? Why, why are we not reaching a sense of a statutory acceptable, uh, uh, you see, timelines in as far as the appointment of the board. If you trust them, why don't you appoint them? Uh, you uh, put a line, and a thick line in terms of the, the actually uh, prescribed times uh, in terms of the statute uh, to appoint them. Uh, those are the, the two areas which I would want to dispense with before I would uh, get into the presentation, Chair. I think let's start with the embers. I think in large part, the board doesn't appoint itself. So, Uslalo Ngegashu Nautwai Engayen was permanent chair or interim chair. So, DM, when are we getting a fully fledged permanent board? The board of Dinelli is permanent, is full time. This one that is appearing before you today. Is a permanent chair? Is it? <laughs> it was in term in 2021 for reasons that are known at the time when they were restructuring after the collapse as a result of state capture. And, uh, and, then, and we had to start with a board that can come in and clean. So, and yesterday when we were engaging with the chair, and I did say this matter is going to raise, is going to be raised here, uh, to say uh, the, there's this view that the board is not yet permanent. And uh, but I don't know what is it. Uh? No, just with the um, <clears throat> in the correspondence to me. Yes, yeah. that's why I keep these records. Yeah. The letter signed by the chair, chairperson of the board in brackets. Okay. Interim. This is interim. Yeah, I think there was confusion. Uh, I, I, thank you, Chairman. I think the board itself is not interim. It's normal board. Um, that's why we sign accounts, we do all of those things that the board must do. What is the interim is the Chairman thing. Okay. But the board itself. Is, uh, is, uh, is, is absolutely fine. And, and so that interim chairman, I'm a board member, the interimness 
is in the chairman thing. But the board itself is, uh, is actually fine, it's, it's not interim. Maybe that's in no one's, it's uh, there. We, we had a board of, uh, I can't remember, 13 people or something, yeah. and then uh, a number of board members left, and then the board that remained, then they had to find somebody to chair that board, and that's me. And it was interim, it's even forgotten, but we make sure that when we do write <laughs> documents, that we do write interim chairman because we must not mislead uh, anyone about the permanency of the chairmanship. But the board itself is not interim. That's the difference. How many members are on this board? Okay. How many members on the board? We are six now, six Out board of members. Yeah. We have a quorum. We are corrected. Unless I don't understand arithmetic, if the full complement is 13, and we are only left with six, if, if I understand the interim chair correctly. Marina, can you answer the question as the company secretary chairman, sorry. And also, um, when did you start acting? If I can just get that clarity. So I'll just check the latter, but our memorandum of cooperation says we have to have a minimum of three and a maximum of 13. We've changed that now. The MOI is with the department at the moment. We're going to go for a maximum of 10. So we don't have to have the maximum. We only have to have the minimum. So we've elected for six. Well, we've got eight, including our, non -exec our executive directors. And then we've requested a further two. So we'll be 10 in the end. I hope that's, I'll just check the chair's um, appointment. I think it was 2020 maybe, but I'll just check that quickly. So, so minimum of three. And, and so well, if the MOI says minimum of three, maximum of 13, they've got six, they will add two. The chair will be, they will appoint a chair, right? I think. The, okay, we let only will have to be finished then. And yeah, then oh, no, I just wanted to yeah. ask. I've asked already. The when did you start um, acting? For how long now? But but as they are checking, I, I think you have heard that we have approved two additional and the board is on the recruitment to, of the skills that are needed to add so that they move from six to eight. And that was given as a permission when they consulted with the shareholder. And, but the processes of looking, uh, it's in the hands of the board and, and I hope soon they will then be getting the two because that was approved. The, the, the reason why I'm asking why are we still having an interim if the minimum is, is that you can have three, but we are six, why are we still having an interim? Why haven't we appointed a, a permanent chair if the board is permanent? Uh, uh, hence, I want to check in relation to the period that we have served as an interim chair. It sounds as if they are still waiting for someone outside to come and chair. See. All right. Uh, let, let, yeah, I, 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 I think the, the necessity of this discussion, uh, DM, is to pr provide clarity to us about stability moving forward. Because if you had 13 eh, and they are resigning or leaving, right, that's what raises issue. So either way, so you, were, you had 13 because... So I've just pulled out here. In 2018, there was announcements about boards. 
and uh, the chairpersons and so on. And the people who are the board now, well, people have resigned. So the question is, yeah, I think that's the, that's the issue. And the chair is, is, is acting interim. You can use the terms interchangeably, right? Um, she's holding the fort. For how long has she been holding the fort? And that's what goes to the quick question I asked earlier, because last week, colleagues, it was as if because the communication of DP has not clarified the position of the current chair, of the interim chair. Babu Somia? I think uh, one clarity has been made, but one thing still left. Um, as, as, a, as a practice uh, which uh, seek to assist the sitting boards, um, where they would, in terms of governance, they would have to appoint among themselves the chairperson. Is that the case in this instance, or is that the, 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 the executive responsible has appointed the, the chair as acting um, in, that, in, that, in that role? And uh, if has been appointed uh, by the shareholder, there ought to be time stipulation uh, that uh, from this day to that day, uh, or is it an open-ended uh, uh, acting position? Uh, something which uh, something which I wouldn't like uh, to, to happen to me. Uh, I don't know other people, but I wouldn't like it to happen to me uh, if I would uh, be appointed to act in a particular position. It must have a date to start and a date to end. Uh, so the regular aspect of creating predictability, consistency, um, all those uh, required standards uh, in terms of the, 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 the proper and fitting uh, instance of uh, uh, individual who ought to act there. Uh, I think that's, 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 a, that's a point which needs to be somewhat cl be clarified. Hard MS point then becomes relevant. Uh, what are you waiting for? Okay, the, the, the interim chair was appointed on the 25th of February 2021. Okay, so, and yeah, as we speak now, the interim. As interim chair? Mm. Right. Right, now. and then with the full time board, that is going to be expanded as we gave them the go ahead. And, uh, and, and and the shareholder definitely will have time to look at this matter. As, and I think it's, it's, it's correct to say you cannot act forever, but the memorandum of incorporation does not dictate uh, either. So we just have to look at those issues so that the interim element or acting element as you raise might also lead to some kind of instability if we do not attend maximally to that. So I think as a shareholder, we'll take back the matter and we'll definitely engage the board and, and, uh, and, 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 and either before the two joins or as they join, we will then resolve on, on, the, on the permanent uh, chairpersonship and uh, as is the case. And I, I think some of the points we are raising cannot be disputed less. Then take it as a responsibility that the shareholder will have to maximally attend to this matter. Thank you. Okay, so 25 February 2021, when we last engaged with this board, Daniel was on the 24th of August 2021. Yeah, <clears throat> something with your records. Yeah, just um, can we get this in writing, clarity of when each individual was appointed and when those who left left and when the uh, chairperson was appointed. There, there has to be clarity at that level, you know. There just has to be clarity. 
Like I can tell you, right, Honorable Somi was appointed to this committee in 2019. Honorable Siwea, 2023. Honorable, I mean, it's just, manje, I understand why he could about who's who here. But look, let's proceed. Let's go to the presentation, and then they will pull out this information. Uh, CEO? Uh, is the CEO presenting, Chair? Uh, yes, okay. the, the, C, right. the CEO should uh, present. Right. CEO, uh, you, yeah. you please one us take the presentation as read because we have received it, and then you will cover the salient points. If there's any issue that requires clarity, the members will go to it, and Mahum TB will come to you um, afterwards. CEO, over to you, sir. Thank, In thank the interim, please pull out the information about the board, and we just provide clarity on that. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, good morning. Good morning to the committee members. Uh, good morning to, to DM. Uh, good morning to the, the head of the SIU and uh, colleagues from the SIU, as well as uh, Mesorobe Robe and uh, the rest of the Denel board. Um, as introduced, I'm the interim uh, group CEO of Denel. Um, prior to my appointment in September of 2022, um, I was the the, my appointed position in the organization is that of a divisional chief executive of one of the larger divisions within the group, um, and also a member of the, of the group executive committee, just by way of background. Um, I think as, as, we, as we go into-, into One the second, big, right. so you're acting, right? Since September 22, and then in your primary position, somebody's acting there. That's correct, Chair. All right, you see the dilemma. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think it's always important to, to reflect on the role of Denel uh, within the South African economy. Um, as a, a, a state-owned, uh, commercially-driven organization, and um, whose primary purpose is to design, develop, manufacture, and support the, the South African National Defense Force, particularly in terms of uh, what we call the prime mission equipment. We, we derive our mandate from the, the defense review policy of 2015, uh, which clearly stipulates in terms of um, uh, the role that Denel must play. We, we play a big role in terms of uh, uh, enabling the defense force uh, to fulfill its, uh, its, constitutional, its constitutional mandate. And, and part of that support we provide as the, as the defense force deploys, uh, either internally or externally, as we've seen uh, in one or two countries on the continent, uh, the DRC and uh, Mozambique. Next slide. Just, just in terms of, uh, and this talks to the prime mission equipment of the of the entity, uh, that, uh, or rather, the prime mission equipment of the defence force. We we support uh, the services of uh, of the national defence force, being being the army, uh, the primary mission equipment uh, deployed in the army, uh, predominantly Denel equipment. Um, as well as the, the South African Air Force. Um, I think with the South African Air Force as it deploys sometimes uh, providing humanitarian relief, we, we see a lot of uh, the helicopters uh, from the Defense Force. Uh, some of those helicopters are, are, are Denel uh, originally uh, manufactured equipment, um, as well as the Navy. The Navy is not necessarily the, the, the vessels, uh, but more the equipment that is installed on the, on the vessels. So, so as, as this slide depicts, uh, we, we do play uh, quite an important role uh, in terms of uh, support to the National Defense Force. As, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Robe has uh, indicated, uh, the board uh, went through a process of uh, approval of the, the current turnaround plan. I think previously in 20, 2021, August 2021, uh, there was a, a plan that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was presented. I think they subsequently uh, been an evolution of that plan to the current one that is busy under implementation. And I think importantly was that um, to ensure that there's buy-in, there was a quite extensive engagement uh, with, the, with the key stakeholders uh, related to the Denel business uh, to th that, that ensured that uh, there was buy-in 
and that uh, as part of the turnaround plan, because sometimes it talks about uh, uh, core and non-core capabilities, that the core capabilities of the Defence Force are retained uh, uh, and then now continues to support that. So this slide really just gives you a summary of uh, the extensive engagements that we've had uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, aligning the stakeholders to, to, the, to the turnaround plan that is currently under implementation. I think the approach that we had um, when, uh, when we developed the, the, this plan, uh, this, this strategic approach we had, was, was really to have an introspection and reflect in terms of where we were, um, to look at the, the external environment, to understand our own internal environment, um, to develop the strategy and to, and to deal with the leadership uh, uh, issue. I think uh, there's been discussions around leadership here uh, to ensure that we move to the to be and desired uh, position. Um, where we are in terms of the, the, the plan and the different phases of, uh, of the turnaround plan um, was that we, we needed to define a phase where we stabilize uh, the organization. I think uh, in previous reports, um, the organization had gone through some, some difficulties internally and externally. Uh, it was important to, to stabilize uh, the organization. And um, as part of that stability uh, and part of the plan uh, was to identify uh, inter internal to Denel uh, uh, funding sources. And we talk about the Denel Medical Benefit Trust, uh, which, was, which unlocked some cash uh, that enabled us to, to deal with uh, legacy salaries that we had not paid to employees uh, for a while. Um, we had uh, liquidation creditors that uh, that were that were on our case, as well as uh, ensuring that we we stabilise the workforce, uh, because I think there was instability in terms of the workforce, because people were not paid salaries, people were not coming to work because they did not have the means to come to work, um, and and um, and refine uh, um, refine as part of that stabilisation, refine the turnaround plan uh, to, 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 to reflect a new operating model that we'll share. Um, as at the end of May, we are, we are transitioning from a stabilized, stabilized phase into a sustainment phase. Uh, part of the sustainment phase uh, talks to the, the recapitalization of uh, the business uh, that was, uh, um, that was uh, 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 that, that, that came through the organization at the end of, end of, end of March, uh, that has enabled us to continue with the initiatives of, uh, of stabilizing and sustaining uh, the, operati the operations. Um, going forward, uh, we're gonna be focusing on a, on a growth part of the business, where we are focusing on the opportunity pipeline uh, that we have developed over time um, to focus on um, the export revenue opportunities that are there to, to, to also uh, focus on uh, stabilizing uh, the, the local or rather the, the orders that we have and ensure that um, as part of implementation we, we, we execute the orders as, uh, as, as we have in the contracts. Chair, the, I think when we last presented uh, to the committee we, this was the picture of the organization. The turnaround plan uh, was, uh, was talking about a two-division uh, uh, organization. Um, we had uh, six fully-fledged uh, operating divisions uh, with own support functions, uh, being the, the human resource uh, function, the ICT, finance, and supply chain, etc. cetera. The, the entities, the six entities uh, were operating as a uh, sort of autonomous, reporting to a, a corporate office, a head office, uh, but uh, operating as uh, autonomous entities. Um, part of the turnaround uh, or the reflection and introspection was to have a review of that, a review of the, 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 the two division strategy that we also, that we also came up with, um, and to, to then um, redefine uh, the organization and the new operating model going forward. If you can move to the next slide, please. So, so part of part of that was to to look at the we we talk about the 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 battle domains within the defence um, was to 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 consolidate activities around landward capabilities where we grouped the the, the three entities that relate to uh, primarily landward capabilities 
um, being Denel Lens Systems, uh, Denel Vehicle Systems, uh, and Denel PMP, which is uh, the small, uh, 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 small to medium arms uh, uh, manufacturing business. We, we also then looked at the air capabilities, um, which relates primarily to the, uh, the aeronautics uh, business, which supports aircraft, uh, both as a design uh, authority or OEM, as well as, as a, 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 an in-service support, uh, providing maintenance uh, support services uh, to, to the Air Force. We, we have a test range here in the Western Cape at, uh, um, um, at Predastop. Uh, that is a test and evaluation center. This is where we would test uh, particularly aerospace-related uh, uh, weapon systems, um, uh, accuracy of missiles, and so forth. So we then consolidated that into what we call the air capabilities. Um, and also because of where the, the, the what we, we refer to as Denel Dynamics uh, is, um, the one that was uh, most hit by the, some of the challenges that we had where we had uh, people leave the organization. We needed to focus that business uh, to being a guided weapons uh, business. Now, in doing that, what we've had to do is we've had to then integrate the unmanned aerial vehicle systems uh, capabilities that resided within that business uh, and consolidated with what we call the air capabilities. Um, and also, uh, re-looked at the, the integrated system solutions, which is a complex engineering uh, organization that, that does a, a ground-based air defense systems that protect the airspace of the country um, to to, to, to rather have that as a standalone uh, organization to, uh, and also focus because of the skill sets that are there in, the in that uh, integrated systems, uh, to focus that business uh, uh, into the future or around uh, civil security solutions, uh, cyber, and, 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 and so forth. So, so we, that, that uh, led to the four divisions. If we go to the next slide, um, that... Um, I think here it's uh, just the detail around uh, what I've just said. Um, but if we go to the next slide, it depicts uh, basically the, the new operating model of Denel, where which was approved uh, in, uh, in July of 2022, where we still, within that model, we have associate companies, what we call associate companies being companies where Denel owns uh, less than 50% of shares, uh, being Rhine Metal Denel Munitions, uh, based here in the Western Cape, as well as uh, in Gauteng and the Northwest, um, as well as uh, Hensold Optronics, also uh, based in South Africa, uh, where we own 39, 30%. Rhine uh, Metal Denel Munitions, we, own, uh, we still own 49%. We've retained our 49% ownership of the business. Uh, and Parich Dynamics, Parich Dynamics uh, is a business that we, uh, we established in the United Arab Emirates, uh, where we, we own 49% uh, of that company uh, with the, the edge group of, of the UAE, a defense company uh, owned by the UAE uh, a government owning uh, the, the, the balance of the shares. Um, so we, we have retained uh, the, the ownership of, uh, of those three entities as associate companies. And, and going forward, as I've explained earlier, we will have a, a guided weapons a capability that focuses on, on missiles and precision guided munitions uh, the landward capability, which looks at uh, what we call firepower, being uh, the infantry weapons, the, the, which is the smaller, smaller guns, uh, the big guns, uh, being the artillery systems, um, as well as uh, the mobility side of the business, which is, uh, which is the, the vehicle side of the business, uh, the guys that, that uh, design and develop uh, the vehicles that sometimes carry these, uh, these guns. As, as well as the, the ammunition part of the business that, uh, that is uh, what we've known as, uh, as PMP. Um, the air capability, um, uh, as I said, uh, in, integrates the, the test and evaluation center in, in, uh, at, at Predastop, the, the aeronautics capability, as well as uh, the, the, the unmanned aerial vehicle systems. And, and a new entity that uh, we, we call integrated system solutions uh, will continue with uh, the ground-based air defense systems, as well as uh, diversify into, into cyber and, uh, and, and civil security solutions. I think important here is to say that we've also um, introduced a shared services model, 
where we had shared services uh, as opposed to previously where we each, each division had uh, its own HR, its own finance, and its own ICT. Uh, we've introduced a shared services model that looks across all the shared services required for the business. Uh, in, included in that is a, a migration from the the current, uh, 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 the, the current situation where we have uh, enterprise resource planning systems uh, around four uh, consolidating into one, uh, one, one, one ERP system that would, uh, that would uh, make for easier reporting uh, going forward. Um, and and, and this, this, we believe, is, 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 a, is a model that is customer facing. If we talk to, to the Army, uh, the landlord capability talks to the Army. If we talk to the to the Air Force, as an example, uh, the air capability talks to the to the to the Air Force and so forth. Um, uh, it, ref it reflects the the battle the battle domains uh, that we that we that we talk about in terms of air, land, and sea. This 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 slide has got a, a bit of detail, but I think uh, we've reflected on it. But I think what is important is as part of the. The stabilisation uh, side of uh, of the business, as, as I said earlier, we needed to deal with uh, with the legacy salaries. We needed to deal with litigation uh, creditors. We needed to ensure that there's uh, there's work the workforce stability, and that was achieved um, uh, through a funding model which was in two parts. Uh, the one part being uh, uh, internal. Uh, internal uh, funding from Denel, uh, identify non-core assets, uh, and uh, through a PFMA process, uh, uh, disposing of those assets and getting cash in. And we, we've reported previously, I think, around the, the Medical Benefit Trust, which, which enabled us to, 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 to drive a lot of the, the stabilization phase. The second part of it being the recapitalization. The recapitalization, uh, which came with, uh, with conditions, um, I think my colleague will talk to the numbers in terms of uh, uh, what those amounts were. But the, the recap, uh, there were uh, post-disbursement uh, conditions as well as uh, uh, pre-disbursement conditions. We, a, a monitoring committee was set up uh, that ensured that uh, Denel met the pre- and post-conditions. And uh, on the back of that, um, uh, National Treasury released uh, the funds, 55% uh, of the funds uh, of, uh, of the 3.4 billion that uh, that uh, the, the entity was uh, was recapitalized by, uh, to assist with the uh, stabilization of the business, um, and and on an ongoing basis, on a monthly basis, there is a, a monthly monitoring committee, uh, which is chaired by by the Department of Public Enterprises, with National Treasury being part of it. The DOD being the main, uh, the Department of Defense being the main customer for Denel, as well as AMSCO as the AMSCO as the as the as the contracting agent for for the Department of Defense, um, and we, as as I've mentioned, we uh, we are um, moved from the stabilization phase into the sustained phase. And there's a number of activities that uh, that we've defined uh, going forward in terms of uh, the next year, where we need to uh, conclude as part of the as part of uh, moving into the new organisation. We had to look at also the skills mix, um, and uh, um, there was an, a labour relations act uh, section 189 restructuring that we've gone through. We need to conclude on uh, on those activities, stabilise the organisation, and then uh, uh, move forward in terms of. Uh, Securing new revenue streams, uh, implementing the efficiencies that we would have derived from uh, from that restructuring effort, um, uh, strengthening the the management and the commercial skills within the organisation, um, and the continuous improvement focus uh, in terms of ensuring operational excellence uh, going forward. So, the in terms of talent management, I think uh, important to to mention that. The, the organization, as, uh, as alluded to earlier, has lost uh, skills. The, the, the worst hit division was uh, the dynamics uh, business, which, uh, which is the missile and precision guided munitions business. Um, we are in a rebuilding phase. Um, and part of that rebuilding phase uh, has a strong focus on reframing uh, on the correct skill sets to make sure that uh, there's a focus on, uh, on the technical and engineering skills that we need. Um, and, and, and the combination of uh, getting external skills uh, where we would go out to the market and bring some, some of the, in some instances, it's some of the people that may have been lost to the organization. 
Um, in some instances, it's, a, it's a, as part of the, the, the restructuring, uh, re-looking at the, 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 particularly the engineering skills that are within the organization and re, redeploying them into, into other areas, like we are doing with the unmanned aerial vehicle systems where they will benefit from uh, being part of an, an aircraft organization, being uh, Denel Aeronautics. So there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a, a, a plan around how we're going to re um, recapacitate the organization uh, with a core um, uh, formed on the, the basis of the annuity business that we would have, where we have on an annual basis uh, contracts that we have that can sustain uh, uh, also defining what is uh, sovereign and strategic uh, capabilities that are required uh, primarily for our defense force and ensuring that that becomes the core of the of the team that we will have uh, going forward. Um, because we are a pro project organization, uh, we are also looking at uh, the flexibility of, uh, of having fixed term contractors that would come into the organization for a period of time that we have uh, projects, uh, whether it's export or, or local, uh, and then uh, it will be time-based and it will only, uh, at the end of those projects, uh, will, uh, will the people leave. So we will have a, a flexible um, a model uh, going forward where we'll have a core permanent team um, and, and a um, fixed term uh, that, is, uh, that is based on, uh, on the projects that we would get. Uh, Chair, I, I, I think it's this, there's, there's some detail here. Um, I will uh, I will take it as read and, uh, and 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 just indicate that the that is the model, the the, the 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 human resource and staffing model going forward would be based on that. Where it's, uh, there's a core component of uh, permanent people, as well as uh, contracting uh, uh, people uh, based on uh, on a project basis. If we can then move to to the next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, my colleague uh, Tande Gasabella to, to take us through the, the, the liquidity and the funding and, and where we are in terms of that. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair and um, honorable members. Um, just briefly, uh, we've already, uh, I mean, it's been alluded in the meeting in terms of the status of Denel in the years 2020 and subsequent to that. When we were in... in uh, yeah. As early like how we started with the CEO, your position, are you acting, how long are you I acting? I am the interim group CFO. I've been acting since March 2021. Right. From which position? I am, I'm, internally I'm the group FM um, that was reporting to the group CFO at corporate. Uh, my current position has no acting, uh, so I've got two hats at the moment. Okay. Thank you. You can proceed. Thank you. Um, so, as, as initially reported, Second. your current position does I'm, not have. A, there's no one acting in it, so she's it. doing. No, no, no. So uh, oh. she's acting in her principal position. There's there's no one acting, so she's holding both. She's doing her job and the acting job of CFO. Multitasking. Okay. Okay. Proceed, ma'am. Thank you. We reported that in 2021, uh, Denal was in an insolvent position, which continued in 2022. Um, in the same financial years, 2021 and 2022, Denal received um, 3.6 billion rands of um, funds from Treasury. Those funds were strictly used, utilized for the repayment of bonds which were guaranteed by the government. That receipt, whilst it improved the solvency position in the 2021 and 2022 financial year, did not deal necessarily with the fundamental operational challenges that were faced by Denal. It therefore became quite clear that when we were formulating the turnaround uh, plan, we needed to come up with a funding strategy that deals with the structural changes in Denal, and that's alluded to by some of the reorganization that has been talked about, but as well as some um, um, liquidating some of our core, non-core assets so that we can unlock cash into the business. And this was done through the DMVT and the recap that was received. Next slide. The funding strategy was quite clear. In support of the turnaround, we need to deal with the operational, critical operational requirements, um, the sustainability and growth phase of the turnaround, but also dealing with the underlying key and current obligations and legal obligations that we had. One of those 
Um, and so the funding was in twofold. Denial had to uh, come up with funds of its own. So whilst we required 5.2 billion to, to resuscitate the business, 1.8 billion of that was going to come through denial sale of non core assets. And the remainder of 3.4 billion was going to come through from the recapitalization from the government. At the end of, uh, at the end of 2023, which was um, around July, August of that year, we were, un we were able to unlock funds from the DMBT funds the Denial Medical Benefit Fund, which allowed us then to do a couple of things. At that stage, the members will recall that we were not able to pay all of the employees their salaries. With those funds, we then were able to pay all outstanding fees of uh, all outstanding salaries for employees so that we can reset and stabilize the business and operations. We were able to deal with some of the liquidation applications that we had coming both from labor and some of the critical suppliers. And we were able to also deal with or table a payment plan to start so that we can stabilize the tax status of Denal so that we can continue to, to operate. The, the 992, whilst it didn't deal in its entirety with the legacy obligations that Denal had, but it allowed us to then stabilize the business and gave us a, a fighting chance to be able to see the Denal and, res, and resuscitate it to the, uh, to the Denal of, 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 of former glory. Next slide, please. The status of the annual reports. In the last uh, three years, uh, well, we last tabled financial statements in 2020. In the intervening years, 2021 and 2022, we've seen revenues reduced to 2.3 billion, and in the last financial year, revenue is 1.4 billion. At the same time, um, indicative of the operational challenges that we had, we also see a reduction of our headcount. In 2021, the headcount was two. 5,000. It has reduced now to 1,670 employees at the end of um, March 2023. Um, following that, we then also see a, a, a loss uh, slash earnings before interest and tax since the for the three years. In 2020, we posted a loss of 1.5 billion rand. We in 2023 are um, posting a profit or earnings before interest and tax of 390 million rand, which then shows the improvements that um, we, 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 we see over the years and in the current financial year. Next slide. We, as, as previously indicated, we were unable to table financial statements for the financial year of 2021-2022. We submitted those financials to the Audit, Auditor General late. The, the 2021 financials were submitted to the AG in November of 2022. The 22 financials were submitted to the AG at 31 January of 2023. Upon submission of those financials, the AG was unable to commence with the audit due to the outstanding fees that we had to table a, a payment plan to the AG, which we've subsequently done and started making payments to, 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 to the AG. And since then, the AG has commenced with the audit of those financial year. We've also then submitted the, F, the financial, financials for audit to the AG for March 2023. And the expectation or discussions with the AG is that they will audit all of these years concurrently. Um, we, are in, um, we are still awaiting a final date on when the audit of those financials will be completed, at which date then we'll be able to table the uh, both the outstanding annual report as well as the, the annual report for 2023. Next slide, please. The status of irregular expenditure for, for the years 2023. The irregular expenditure balance, the, including uh, legacy, is 3.2 billion, uh, of which um, some of it is split for the years pre-FY uh, uh, 2018. It is important that we distinguish that because since then, there's been quite a number of work that, be, that had been done um, to, to reduce the on-year irregular expenditure whilst we deal with the legacy irregular expenditure. The key challenge is really re um, uh, that resulted in the prior uh, irregular expenditure came with misinterpretation of the regulations by Denal and misalignments of those regulations to supply chain policies which have since been um, uh, resolved in the, in, in, the, in the coming years. Next slide. Since 2018, the irregular expenditure has decreased by 98%. In the 2023 financial year, the irregular expenditure is 20 million. 
Um, whilst at the mo in 2019, uh, the board had commissioned an investigation on irregular expenditure pre-FY 2018, due to liquidity uh, uh, constraints, we were unable to conclude that. So the forecast for 2023 would be 2023, 2024 would be to finalise our inv investigations, as well as have a, a, a structure, a fit for purpose structure, in capacitating the skills within the denial to then deal with um, consequence management and further investigations that need to be done. The next slide, please. The, the, the compilation of the 2023 um, irregular expenditure, as I said, of 20.2 20 20 million, 20 million rands is made up of, uh, uh, number one, 9.6 million linking to deviations from competitive bidding and 10.1 10, 10 uh, 10 million rand leading to tax clearance certificates not obtained. The context to this irregular expenditure is um, in some of our areas, particularly in the air division, we deal with um, supply aeronautics as we see it on the slide. We deal with suppliers who, who, from whom we import who are also OEM, so original manufacturers of, the, of some of the spares parts that we, 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 we provide to, 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 to the aircraft. Um, and in certain instances, they were unable to either provide a tax clearance because they're a foreign entity or in certain instances, because the foreign entity didn't and didn't appreciate some of the processes that we have to undergo, were not really um, uh, did not you know did want to submit some of all of the documentation required uh, as part of our procurement processes, which then had led to to the irregular expenditure. Um, the 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 concern, or rather the risk that we took in terms of because these are OEMs and the absence of them being able to provide. The, the space that we needed would have meant that we would have to grant some of the aircraft that we provide to, to the Air Force. And as a result, um, in our assessment, uh, whilst it is regular expenditure, there's been no fraud or criminal activities related to those transactions. Next slide. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, this part of the, 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 the presentation deals with the, with the investigations and some of uh, the internal activities. I think um, it will complement the, the presentation by, by the SIU as well, because some of the matters may be covered here and by the SIU. But in terms of the, 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 the VR laser matter, which was, uh, is quite a material one uh, that relates to, to fraud corruption and uh, contravention of the PFMA, um, I think a summary of it is that uh, there was improper and unlawful conduct by the NEL officials, um, and, and consequently, um, there, there has been uh, disciplinary uh, charges that were, were laid against the employees, and uh, there was summary dismissal. Um, there's a, there's a, a process that they, I think they, probably the SIU would uh, be better positioned to deal with in terms of uh, uh, going forward. Uh, around the Ill illegality of uh, of the particularly the VR laser matter, the the, the procurement of a uh, chassis uh, without a due process chair. I think uh, we just want to mention an oversight on our part, um, where in the report we are saying that uh, none was found guilty. Um, I think uh, there were people that were found guilty. Um, there is uh, currently an employee who is. Um, who is uh, undergoing a, a discipl unrelated disciplinary uh, a case. Uh, my understanding of it is that uh, the, the, there will be finality on that. Uh, this was not part of the charges, and then we will, uh, we will deal with the uh, issues around uh, this uh, irregular, uh, or rather this uh, fraudulent uh, corruption that, uh, that happened uh, at the time in terms of uh, uh, the procurement of chassis uh, to the tune of that uh, 69 million. So what's the correction then? The correction is the, where it says none was found guilty. There is a, an employee that was found guilty. Um, there is a, an, another employee. These are the ones that are in the employ of the company, uh, still in the employ of the company. Um, that is going an unrelated disciplinary uh, a case um, uh, that we believe there will be there will be a, a finding uh, in this week uh, around that, and then we will deal with the, the matters around this uh, specific ENNE issue. If we go to, to the next slide, um, this relates to, to the, 
the improper establishment of a, of a foreign entity, uh, Denel Asia, uh, which was uh, established uh, back in, I think, around 20, 2016, 2017. Um, we, we've gone through quite a process. We, we have been able to deregister the, the company in Hong Kong. They had not been trading uh, within this entity. It was established primarily to, to position Denel to do uh, work in the India market uh, at the time. Uh, it was irregular and uh, did not follow due process in terms of uh, the PFMA. Uh, and whatever the funds that were there uh, were more for administrative purposes. We have been able uh, to repatriate some of these funds and deregister the company. Uh, in terms of consequence management, the former group CEO uh, resigned before uh, disciplinary processes uh, could, be, could, be, uh, could be established uh, against him. I think there's a, there's a process that we are working with, uh, with the Department of Public Enterprises on around uh, delinquency, uh, especially in terms of the companies and intellectual property uh, commission around some of uh, the directors uh, that were part of the transaction. The, there was also a, a, a process that uh, did not follow the NEL policy and also contra contravened the PFMA in terms of the, the award of a, of a bursary. Uh, again, it's a, I think it's one of the matters that uh, the SIU has, uh, has assisted, us, assisted us on. And there is also a, a criminal case uh, that, uh, that we are aware with, of uh, within the SAP, SAPS. Um, and uh, if, if, if it's fine, Chair, we would uh, defer it to the SIU uh, investigate, uh, the presentation. The, the next slide uh, relates to, uh, again, the uh, contravention of Denel policy and, uh, and PFMA, uh, where a, there was a, a technical advisor that was appointed without having followed due process. Um, the technical advisor uh, was subsequently uh, paid an amount. This technical advisor related to the contract that Denel concluded with Chad in 2017. Uh, payment was made uh, illegally to, to this technical advisor. Uh, there were employees that were, that were disciplined. Two were found guilty and were not part of, are no longer part of uh, the organization. Um, we have struggled to, uh, to, to, to locate uh, the one uh, employee uh, despite uh, using uh, tracking, uh, tracking uh, uh, services of, uh, of companies. The, 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 the CFO resigned, the CFO of the entity, the division, the Netherlands Systems, that, uh, that did this transaction, resigned on the eve of, uh, of the disciplinary being uh, instituted against them. The, the, the next matter, which relates to uh, Barrage Dynamics, uh, quite a complex one because we have 49% uh, ownership in this company. Um, I think, uh, again, uh, uh, through the chair, I would defer this to the SIU uh, process in terms of activities that are, that are underway uh, in relating to, to that, uh, that entity. The next slide, acquisition of uh, Denel Vehicle Systems, uh, where there was uh, governance contravention. Um, former executives did approve, obtain uh, necessary approvals for the funding of the acquisition, but uh, subsequently uh, failed to, 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 to obtain approval uh, in terms of uh, changes in the payment terms. Um, the opinion we received uh, from council was that uh, indicated that the matter had prescribed and Denel would not be able to recover any damages from previous uh, executives. The, the, the next item being procurement of legal services. Um, I think again, Chair, this one is uh, one that is dealt with uh, uh, through the, the SIU report uh, uh, that can uh, provide further detail uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of processes around that. And then uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Chair, is, the, is the, the improper financial assistance provided uh, to, to LMT, which is a, an, an entity that Denel uh, had a majority share. The contravention there was in terms of uh, the PFMA as well as uh, uh, the section, uh, section 45 of the Companies Act in regard to, to that financial assistance. Uh, a report uh, has been completed and uh, presented to the audit committee of the board. 
uh, to be legally reviewed for implementation of the recommendations once uh, once finalized. I think, Chair, those are the, the that that brings us to the end of uh, our presentation of, in terms of uh, issues that we needed to pick up from from the previous uh, presentations uh, to to the committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you much, Madam Chair. If there's anything in conclusion before we go to the SIU, and then we'll take, um, we're going to deal with investigation separately. All right. Let's take investig. We'll leave the last part, colleagues. We'll deal with the uh, Danelle presentation, except for investigations and the related matters, and then we'll take Wabum TB uh, afterwards. Is that fine? All right. It's fine for me, Chair. Madam Chair, just one second. Mm -hmm. Are you done with your presentation or any other? All right, fine. Babu Samia. Chair, thanks for your indulgence. No. Um, it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit opportunistic uh, here. Um, it was of my own uh, predicament. Okay, and and, and uh, no, no, thanks for the for the presentation. Um, um, in the presentation, there are a few grey areas which I, I, I think one needs some form of a clarity on. One, starting with the uh, position of the CFO, um, that that is 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 left holding the current position while she performs duties on the acting. Uh, uh, a CEO position. I don't, I don't know, uh, probably to, to the chair or the C, C, CEO, in terms of answering this, is there no, in terms of your risk appetite, have, have you looked into um, that kind of a <coughs> scenario? Because she, she is now acting as a group CFO, and, and she is as well acting in her other capacity uh, where, where things ought to be some form of separation uh, around certain matters that she ought to act on. And, and therefore, the risk appetite uh, is, is somewhat we bring there. Uh, probably the board would have to look into uh, such uh, areas which uh, would require the eye in as far as the, uh, such areas are concerned. And the time has been too long. And therefore, if you're talking into that risk uh, instance, uh, it, it, it then uh, look into the exposure um, around such matters, which are of the risk uh, context, uh, something which uh, probably uh, the board would need to look into uh, going forward. Not unless you have assessed it, you are much more satisfied in the way that, that there is absolutely no uh, areas that you need to worry about. The second area for me is the area that relates to um, <clears throat> the IP. Uh, though, though in the presentation, uh, looking into the areas of investigations, things are somewhat uh, uh, looking at. Your relationship uh, with the UAE company as a minority shareholder, uh, are you getting into that kind of relationship uh, with a packaged uh, IP uh, uh, reliant partner or uh, the, 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 the context uh, of your IP content is not carried over into that kind of relationship? And if yes, <coughs> what, how do you relate uh, into your, your hefty angle uh, that you are getting into a position being a minority where you carry substantively uh, the intellectual property, uh, getting into that kind of relationship. What, what, what sort of angle do you uh, think uh, you anchor uh, your, your hold in that relationship being a minority uh, stakeholder? Uh, somewhat. What were your assessments uh, reaching into that kind of a decision? And then the, the third uh, question, Chair, uh, relates to um, 
this exciting um, visible improvement. Um, before my excitement, I, I, I want to ask a few, a few questions probably relating to this uh, solvency position. Your solvency position is a positive, uh, uh, of positive side, but is it not probably you are saying so, but you are not necessarily uh, showing that detail in terms of side. Looking into your presentation earlier on, uh, when, when, when you expose us on the recap uh, processes, that, that government throws in about uh, 3.4 3, 3. billion rand. And uh, uh, the other amounts um, are run uh, through some uh, uh, kind of your, uh, 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 you see, areas that you have to, you had to live without uh, in terms of your sales and so forth. And uh, we have realized the, an amount of about in total 6.19 billion rand. And, and, um, and, and uh, if, if your totality in a recap uh, uh, and, and uh, the, the modeled uh, requirement uh, in terms of the total amount is 5.2 billion rand. So, so there you'll be left with about uh, 992 million rand um, as, as, as out of that process. But there are different proceeds which are not necessarily of an active, productive nature, which will have realized uh, some form of gains uh, as per your activities as a company. Uh, and uh, you have to deal with other things in terms of your legacy out of that amount. So your, 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 your solvency position, as it stands, is, is laying heavily, is it laying ev heavily on, on, on such uh, outcomes, or is it laying uh, towards some realization uh, of your core competency uh, around your gains? And if that is the case, um, looking into the slide which I was dealing with, uh, the, uh, your, your, your actual improvement, stabilization, and all that stuff. So, so are you going there? Are you at that point, or is this a falsified uh, uh, a, a temporal movement, uh, something which we need to worry about going forward? Uh, what, what are your assertions uh, around, around, around that uh, uh, aspect? And then lastly, is a, I read something here. I said, so I appreciate it from the chairs I was in. So, so I want to emphasize the point Chair which says. There, there is a commitment from, from the chair of the board, and uh, when you made your own input, you st st stated that one, the CFO and the CEO are not necessarily under the microscopic eye of the, CI, uh, of the SIU. And, and uh, you are working very well uh, with the uh, with, uh, SIU uh, around matters uh, of uh, investigations. Um, and, and that commitment is, is somewhat uh, applauded. I think uh, we need to appreciate that kind of commitment. But I've seen in the SIU's uh, uh, presentation uh, a liner which was uh, seeking to say uh, in a subtle way, that in their, in their own investigations, whether is it within Danel or anywhere else, there has been some, some form uh, led to a lack of a, uh, some understanding between yourselves um, uh, on other matters that they have warned you on. Uh, you see, um, uh, and, and which then indicates that while there is that kind of commitment, there are areas where there is a slippage uh, of uh, uh, that substantive nature uh, of you working together, that at the times when you ignore uh, some advice um, and, and uh, you, you handle things, though you have been warned against 
uh, in terms uh, of, uh, of uh, handling such. Um, I, I, so, so I wanted to check uh, uh, in terms of your own com co commitment. Is there any of those matters that you have disagreed on? And what are the firm uh, principled base of such disagreement? And uh, what is the nature of such? And what is the impact uh, of such disagreement? Uh, I'm, I'm asking those based on the fact that they made a presentation at some stage to us. I think it was uh, the SAA presentation, which uh, alluded to the fact that they, there are a number of officials, while they are under investigations, they would move uh, to uh, areas others they can't locate, others they would somewhat know and, and uh, point to a particular uh, 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 you see, uh, area uh, of lending. So are, are, are there some of those instances in as far as these areas are concerned? So thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for giving me this uh, uh, line of uh, question. Thanks okay. so much. That's fine. I think let's uh, get uh, responses to that set of questions. Uh, no, no, no. All right, no, chairperson. No, no, no. <laughs> chair, <sorry. laughs> All right, chair of the the, the board. Your mic, Bob Somi. All right, chairperson. Um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, chairman. So the the first one on the CFO position. Uh, yes, it is acting, and you are worried about then what happens under her in terms of the weakening, uh, in terms of where she was and her team. What the issue there has been that as long as we were struggling to pay salaries, it was always going to be a problem to, to replace things and replace people. Um, and so she remains acting in the process of appointing the CEO and the CFO, including the HR director, if I'm not mistaken, is now uh, because we can promise people security of, of, of salary. Otherwise, we would have reactions from people who would really not want to be in that situation. What we have done, though, in the meantime, to take away uh, some of your of the committee's anxiety, is that as a capacity in the finance department, we have dealt with that by bringing in help from outside. Um, that is why you will see that part of the improvements is that we have been able to submit our financials to the Auditor General up to 2023, because that capacity was dealt with in that and in that way. And so, yes, she remains the, the acting uh, CFO, and the process of having a permanent CEO is in the board process and is being dealt with. Now that we can promise people a salary uh, uh, kind of thing. The second one, uh, but Mike and, and Tanika, you can just add if I'm not uh, completing the question. The second one on the IP and the relationship with the UAE, um, very important in the sense that, and that's why we ended up having to sit side by side with SIU, that on the one hand, UAE as an area of business is still an area we have to be in. We have problems in terms of these relationships and the joint ventures and whatever. SIU help us fill the gap. At least we know what we're dealing with in terms of uh, our partnerships and so, so that we're not acting in the dark. And that's why we had to preempt at uh, the meetings with SIU just to make sure that tactically we might be in the UAE region because the business is actually there. We have partners. We just want to know how tactically uh, to deal with that because on the one hand, 
Also, the country does want to have a UAE relationship. And so Denel cannot sit back, but we have to be cautious about how we deal with that. It's quite a severe area for us in terms of this, because we have to have some kind of finesse in terms of how we deal with the UAE, the region. So that is taken care of. And one of the things we had to do was to reinforce uh, our board members into joint venture in the UAE, uh, such that the interest of Denel is, is actually taken care of. So I'm comfortable that as a board, we have placed the appropriate people in that joint venture as board members to watch over these things not to happen again, while parallel to that, SIU is doing its own work in terms of what has gone wrong where, but going future, that we have more caution and, and much more appropriate board members, very important that uh, one of those board members had to have the legal background now. Because the IP issues are not only technical, there's also legal issues. And so one of the non-executive board members that we have put in there from our own non-executive boards has a legal background precisely for that, to deal with that uh, anxiety. The third point on the solvency issues, it is sustainable. Maybe let me start with that. It is a sustainable uh, direction. That is because the things we have <coughs> promised uh, to National Treasury and to um, a DPE are things that we are practically able to do. We didn't promise pie in the sky. So for example, the 992 that you're actually seeing there is, is a financial engineering now. Part of the problems with the denial is that yes, there's production issues, but there's also financial re-engineering things which are such that while the denial is on the floor, for example, is paying added things to things which have got nothing to do with production. And so that medical aid money from uh, the MBT is a financial engineering issue now. Denel, that is a, a benefit fund, and it had a surplus of two billion rands, which means 50% of that surplus belonged to Denel, the sponsor company. That's how benefit structures work. 50% to the company and 50% to the members of that fund, except that trust was structured such that Denel cannot have access uh, to that surplus. And so we had to rearrange that court process, do all of those things. It took longer than we would have wanted it to take, 18 months. That because we had to follow the law and do everything that is required to make sure that uh, nobody is put in trouble. One more thing that the members I know uh, they are always going to be worried about. Did we disadvantage the pensioners in that uh, medical aid? Uh, did we do something untoward uh, to the members of that medical aid? The answer is no. And the way we dealt with that was, one, we had to put Daniel in the place where it is not disadvantaged either, while it is a sponsor it was not able to access the surplus that is sitting there idle while the company is wallowing in, in, in that kind of thing. At the same time, we had to be fair to the members and make sure that they are fully protected. And to do that, uh, we had, for example, three sets of actuaries. There was an actuary for the company, there was an actuary for the pensioners, and there was an actuary for the fund itself. And so these three sets of actuaries had to agree on the assumptions and agree on the numbers. They have to agree, yes, there's a surplus of this much amongst themselves, technically, and each one speaking on behalf of their constituency. But even more important, we had the full support of the pensioner forum, which represents uh, these pensioners. That's why we could go to court and no complications and whatever, everybody was very happy. Just want to say, Chairman, that 
on this medical aid thing, that question of whether we have disadvantaged the pensioners or members, the answer is no. We have dealt with everything fairly, and I'm comfortable that we have not taken any shortcut on anyone. Um, and so the solvency is sustainable because it was a necessary unlocking of that surplus to dinner. And we will look everywhere else because these are, these are what we call them, the legacy issues. These are pre-1990 issues, the post-retirement things are pre-1990 <coughs> issues. And you cannot, while Daniel is on the floor, you have something that is sitting with a surplus for 600 people. Just didn't make sense. So we will definitely look for those opportunities, but believe me, we will, be, we will follow the law and we'll do everything to make sure that everybody is not at disadvantage. The last question uh, on the commitment to, to SIU, I think SIU will deal with that part uh, specifically, but um, sitting where I'm sitting, we are absolutely in touch with SIU, and we share everything in terms of our responses to whatever it is that we have to do and do the right thing. Um, and, and even when we do say we don't think so, there are professional reasons put in front of them. So there is no disagreements necessarily, but SIU will deal with that and, 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 and maybe correct that, um, uh, what is the word now? Misconception or whatever it is. Definitely not. Uh, we work very closely. We actually need SIU, by the way. We actually ask them to help us uh, with these investigations because internally we do not have our own capacity and we had to rely on them uh, to do that as well, besides the fact that they have their own mandate uh, to do it. So I, I just wanted to be comfortable that there's no <coughs> chaos uh, between Daniel and SIU. I had to emphasize though that this board, including the CEO and the CFO, are not a subject of the SIU issues. And therefore, this board is not constrained in terms of responding to what comes from them. Thank you very much, Chami. Thank you very much, Honorable Van Minen. Okay. Hmm? Oh, right. You want the SIU too? Just that point. Okay. All right, no, thanks. Thanks, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, uh, DM, Chair of the Board and Board Members. Um, uh, we would like to confirm what the chair of the board uh, has stated. Uh, uh, since the inception of the investigation, uh, we've had we've had cooperation uh, from the from the institution, uh, and 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 with the with the board in particular, uh, we've had. I mean the. The, the last meeting we had, I can't recall when it was, but it's sort of recent, in, in March, uh, where, where we presented the status of where we are, um, and uh, we ensured that our status and findings are understood by the board, and of course the board chair. So we are at the stage, at this stage, um, where we can confirm that uh, uh, there hasn't been any uh, material disagreements. Uh, indeed, as the chair indicates, uh, and we will probably indicate that when we present uh, around uh, some of the outcomes, findings, and referrals for action to be taken, uh, that uh, uh, where there are uh, differences of views, there are reasons provided, and we, and we take it from there. Uh, but uh, I want to really confirm what the what the chair has indicated. Thanks. Thank you very much, Honourable Sewer. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning to the DM, the interim 
And colleagues from the SIU and everybody else. You, you know, I'm worried about the sequence of dates. Um, if when was the the group CEO suspended vis a vis? when the acting group CEO assumed office. I can get clarity about that. I'm asking this because I want to assume that the process of the DC in relation to the group CEO and the suspended group chair, for example, is taking long, and that causes a problem in terms of stability. Also, if maybe we can get clarity in terms of how far is the process. And it will assist because, for example, I was looking here trying to calculate. Um, if you were appointed in, in 2018, you started acting in 2020, 21. Am I correct? In 2021. How long is your term? When is your term coming to an end? Is it five years? And so, Minister, maybe you can clarify. Are you starting a process of recruiting a new board, if it is five years? Also, to clarify, I heard you DM saying <clears throat> you are in a process of, or it's already approved the process of adding, adding the two. Are you going to do it in terms of the parliamentary process or your statutes allow you to fill without following a process where public enterprise must play a role of assisting you? Um, on page 10 and 11, so you speak about where you are and then you speak about where you want to be. Um, let me open so I can reference correctly. You want to reduce your, your head counts by 890. So I want to take it as a wish list. I'm truly interested in how we're going to implement that. So if you, you minus the 2,200 and Six two two oh six and the one three one six. It gives me something like eight hundred and ninety. I'm interested in truly how are you going to to implement that some form of a project plan for it to come to pass. I'll ask you this. If we go to page thirty one, let's go to page thirty one. say here that the, he left uh, before the DC could be conducted, am I correct? Page 31, you're talking about the group CEO resigned before this another process could be in instituted. What does it mean for me in simple terms? And are his issues linked to the group, to the, to the, to the former chair? Maybe it's how you, you are reporting. I don't necessarily want to go into the SIU issues chair, but I am sure as an institution, as part of self-correcting, it's only two cases where I saw that, it, that you don't necessarily speak about the PMF, the PFMA. All of them is related to violating the PFMA. What is it that you are planning to do as an institution to correct, to empower your employees in that regard? 
because clearly there is a problem around. Either is the understanding of it in terms of following the guidelines for implementation, or there is a deliberate, there was a continuous deliberate ignorance of the PFMA as part of self-correcting for the institution. What is it that you're going to do? Because I honestly think there is a problem here. On page 33, you speak about four disciplinary processes, and then you say two were found guilty, and in that guilty, one you gave a final written warning, and one you gave a written warning. What happened to the other two? They walked free? Or what happened? Unless if your reporting is somehow, I hope I'm making sense. So you speak about four who went for a disciplinary process, and then you report on two, one final written warning, and one written warning, and one written warning. And, I, and I'm, I'm requesting that you truly take us on, on those numbers that when I asked you about, not necessarily the numbers, the years when we started. Um, you, you see if, maybe you must tell us if they, what could be informing the delay. If from, from 2021 you've been acting to date and there's no finality in terms of holding whoever is found guilty so that you can fill the post. If you say somebody resigned and then they left, does it mean you can't fill the post, advertise the post? Uh, the chair was saying, the DM, I'm sorry, he was saying that you are already in the process of filling those two posts. Uh, but you're not reflecting it on the report. So it's more of a, of a verbal reporting, but here the report still says, seems like it's pending, therefore we can't fill. But on the verbal reporting and opening of the DM, he then reports something else to say, we are actually in the process, just like with the, with the issue of, of the number, numbers in the board, we are six, but verbally you then say, but we're filling the two, you know, uh, I think others, they, 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 they need the, the DM to clarify. So I'm truly interested when you say that there's a process, does it include the process of public enterprise, the process of parliament to fill the board, and so on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I think let's get uh, those responses to those questions, Madam Chair. And feel free to delegate yes, as yes, it. I yes. won't interrupt your flow of responses. Okay. Uh, let me start, Chairman. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, so how long is the term of the Chairman or of the Board? It's nine years. Uh, so from 2018, which is the four of us, were in that group that was appointed in 2018. So you can say if the shareholder is still happy with them, they can go up to 2027. And that includes me up to 2027. The question of the chairman, uh, interim, <laughs> to be honest, I think it's uh, the way I'm acting like a permanent one. It's like uh, we're just working because the responsibilities uh, remain the same, whether you are interim or you are permanent. And so I think it is for the shareholder to regularize that or appoint the chairman that they feel like. But in the meantime, the board needs to have a face. And, and so I am uh, in that space. And I think, but I think the department will, will, um, will, um, will look into that. So four of the six board members come from 2018. Two of the current board members come from uh, 21, the non-executives from 21, and that is the uh, Ms. Mohabuti and, uh, and um, Ms. Ramano. They come from 21. So if you take that as 21, and that they will be subject to the nine years, it means they can be here until 2030. So you pretty much have a stability around the six non-executive board members in terms of up to 27, 
and up to 2030. The group CEO and the CFO are here since 2021 and 2022. The process of appointing at the group CEO and CFO is done by this board. It should be done by 23. And therefore, once that happens, then they start their own. But group CEO and group CFO are a subject of being employed. And so, but on the non-executives, you are safe up to 27 and up to 2030. The two board members we were looking at, which we have spoken to shareholder, is to top up this board in terms of the skills, uh, the engineering and the production skills. As to then the process, whether it is parliament or is DPE, but where I'm sitting, the board itself must have those skills, and and therefore they will do what needs to be done. The resignations, uh, we had eight resignations from 2018. That is what weakened the size of the board from whatever number of 12 or 13 to what we remained with uh, four, except we were still within the minimum. And those eight, they resigned in February 2021. And so the topping up is almost like filling up these numbers uh, with the right skills mix. I hope I've answered you on the, on the board members. And um, then the question of the, the acting CEO and the suspended CEO, no, the, the, the acting CEO the suspended CEO is long, long time ago. We have had permanent CEO <coughs> in between. That resigned. Uh, I think two, but two CEOs have resigned. So between what was the suspended CEO in 2015 or 14, we have had permanent CEOs in between, two of them. and. Now we have the acting CEO. So with the acting CEO, it has very little to do with the process around the suspended CEO. We don't have a suspended CEO process as we speak, eh? Tell me. No, no. We don't have a suspended CEO disciplinary process right now because he comes after permanent CEOs who on their own resigned. That's why he's acting. We just have to follow the appointment as is required, uh, whatever. Um, let me leave the head count things now to, to Mike and Tani as to how you are going to, and also Tami, please come in and help as, as the chairman of the remuneration committee in the board. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, the board chair. Um, I think in response to uh, the honorable member's question around the, the head count and the approach towards uh, achieving that, I think um, in the presentation we talk about a, a restructuring in terms of the Labor Relations Act, uh, Section 189, which process we, we started and uh, has been facilitated by, by the CCMA as, uh, as required because, of, because it was viewed as a, a large scale. Um, the the headcount that you refer to as as two two zero six, um, and how we will get to the one three zero six, I think it is, uh, which is the envisaged the headcount. Um, we we have uh, by and large um, moved in terms of that restructuring uh, because the process has been underway. We 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 had a, a what we call a voluntary severance package process where employees uh, volunteered to be retrenched. We looked at the business needs and were able to, were able to, to reduce headcount in terms of that. We, we also had uh, the natural attrition process where people would have resigned or retired um, and we have seen a, a reduction. I think where we are headcount wise uh, is at the end of March 2023. We're sitting at uh, 1,670 uh, employees. Um, which is inclusive of uh, contractors, uh, contract workers, where we've had in the organization people that have resigned because of 
the situation the, the, where the company was, people were resigning uh, to, to have access to, to, to resources in terms of their pension funds and so forth. They've resigned. And because of the criticality of their skills, we've, uh, we've been able to get some of them back. So in that 1,670, we have about 117 contractors as at end of March. Um, with 11 students, uh, we have a, t a technical academy uh, where we still have 11 students that we are taking through the training. Um, we, we, I think we've, we've, we've advanced and, and we can share the numbers in terms of what the final numbers would be, but the, the envisaged uh, headcount, excluding the vacancies, uh, is uh, 1,306. Sorry, colleagues. No, no, no. Thank you very much, Chair. Maybe oh. before you proceed, we I think we are settled with a particular, and it, it may be a matter of semantics, right? But I think it needs clarity. The 2018 statement of the appointment of the board on the 20 on the in 2018. Indicates and the minister says, I have decided to appoint an interim board of directors. And then, of course, this is the board we're talking about. And it goes to the question that Honorable Sonia had raised. And so that's why I've been grappling with this throughout. What is the status of the board? And then it concludes by saying, in accordance with paragraph 639, this is now February 2021, of the date listings requirements and further two announcements released by SENS on 25 February regarding the resignation of Ms. Montlasla as an independent non-executive director and chairperson the Board of Directors of Denel hereby advises that Mr. Robe has been appointed to the board as an interim chairperson with effect from 25 February 2021 until the Minister of Public Enterprises has finalized the appointment of the new board. So you've got an interim board up to now. That's the issue. Why is it not transitioned, or has it transitioned to a permanent board? Because I just think it takes us back to, 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 to where we started, actually. Because we, we need clarity on this thing from a leadership stability point of view. I get the notion that you're just working. That's fine. That, but substantively and correctly, unless there's been a change. So I think that's the clarity that we want, in so far as because the appointments that have been referred to here, and that's why I've just been going through my notes, of 9 April 2018, right? So can we just get clarity on this timeline? Okay, oh, oh, oh. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, According to, the, okay, let me start with the first question or first, uh, that the minister through cabinet processes uh, will then appoint the board. And then you know those processes, we might start with an interim board and then towards a, a full-time board. So the cabinet gets involved and then it then approves. And once there's an approval, the minister will then make the announcement. So when it started in 2018, it was an interim board that uh, where the minister has full-time powers, he's got powers, he doesn't have to take it to the cabinet. So in 2018, when that happened, the minister appointed an interim. And later, subsequently, there was an AGM uh, of the board in 2019. And then the minister took the matter to cabinet for approval and the board was then appointed as full-time. So we just have to get those records, uh, bring them as evidence to qualify 
the issue here so that it does not leave members asking whether it's interim or is not interim. And, and as you know that uh, then there were resignations of eight people, it left four in the processes, uh, and then those timelines will also have to be clarified. And then, then the two additional that were then brought on board, they had to be taken to the cabinet too, will have to also give evidence to that particular uh, effect to say this board is not in term. And then the two that the board came to us and seeking endorsement and support, we gave them the support. The processes is the board. And then once they've got them, they'll then bring them to the shareholder to take to the cabinet process because it's a full-time board. And then once the cabinet endorses, will then be so. And in the appointment of the board, its skills and experience, its gender, mass composition, and demographics. And you can see we're lacking on demographics already. And, and the cabinet are, is very strict on those particular issues. When you take them, you must then say, who are the current board? Uh, what are the skills elements, uh, gender, and then demographics? So in the, the, the looking of the two additional and future, if we are going to go to the maximum, we'll then have to really ensure the effort that we we, we, we are able then to also achieve uh, the, the demographic uh, uh, aspects of it. But I think it, it will then be better to say the question has been raised, the processes have been there, let them bring quite uh, evidence so that this doubt uh, that is there in the minds of the people and probably lack of communication that might have happened uh, can then be clarified once and for all and we then know. But as we speak now, the AGM did, uh, 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 was held and, then in, and the board was then uh, put in as a full-time board and the minister took it to the cabinet and the cabinet endorsed. Thank you. I imagine that will... It doesn't have any parliamentary processes at all. And, and then, Chair, maybe just another matter that uh, came earlier is the issue of the fin money finance. Uh, when the minister of finance announced the 3.4 billion rand recapitalization. It was in the medium budget policy statement of in October 2022. But the money did not flow to, to Dinel. Hence the issue of not appointing because there was no money even to pay or start the processes of recruiting the group CEO and group CFO could not happen. Money came in on the 27th of March, 2023. And I remember as I walk in into the department that the time minister says it's now going to be a responsibility, help them. I had to go and meet with the acting DG of Treasury to say, the more you delay, the more the organization might be taken to liquidation. And the liquidators, uh, the, 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 the creditors were just on the door, uh, almost taking the organization to liquidation uh, and uh, by approaching the courts. There were already intentions of going to court. So therefore, the issue of the permanent group uh, staff could not happen if you are not going to pay them salaries. And, and, and only the money flowed in, in March this year. And that is why the process now by the board has now began now that there will be surety that salaries will be paid and, uh, and, uh, and then adverts and all sorts of things have to, to take place. And then I hope uh, before the end of this year, uh, 2023, uh, those appointments will be in place so that we have permanency even in the management side of things. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Honorable Right CEO. And then Honorable Hatebe, and then we'll take the SIU. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, our oversight there, there were two other questions that we didn't deal with. Um, I'll ask uh, my colleague to deal with the self-correction and the uh, processes going forward in terms of uh, internal controls. But on, on the chart matter, um, the, we mentioned four, with two that were disciplined, uh, two were, were not found guilty, 
But what we can do, just to confirm that, uh, Honourable Member, we can uh, submit uh, a written confirmation of that in terms of the two, with the CFO uh, of the division at the time that resigned uh, before they could be disciplined. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of the, um, the strengthening of the internal control environment, uh, linking to making sure that processes are in place uh, for the prevention of irregular expenditure, the, uh, we have a combined assurance model which deals with, at a management level, we need to make sure we have the requisite skills. Um, um, as indicated previously, we do have a gap because of the exit of employees. So part of that is recapacitating the procurement function. In addition to that, because of the liquidity uh, challenges, we have not had adequate training or regular training throughout the organization for the past three years. So that is definitely one of the initiatives that we would look at to uh, revisit the training elements uh, for all our employees and re, and re um, boss the, the, the procurement uh, functions with the people with the right skills. Obviously, the second layer of assurance then talks about internal audit and in, in, um, in that environment, the board has taken a, a decision to recruit for a chief audit executive that will uh, bolster the, the internal control um, environment with, the, with the, a mixture of a team of, of, of employees internally and the industry to assist to make sure that internal controls are in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Hardeva. Thank you, Chair. Chair, can I request that I ask one question and then get the answer? Oh, we still have got the SIU and time management. Please put your full set of questions and then we will come back to follow-ups because we still have to take the SIU presentation. It's quite comprehensive. All right, no, it's fine. Even though it's not fine. Um, it's fine, Chair. Um, I, I want to say, Chair, the issue of interim and permanent chair, even though they do the same um, work, but there is no stability when you are acting. You can be removed at any time. Um, that creates instability you will trade carefully uh, in executing some of the task because you know that at any time you can be removed. What chair um, we did not get or understand the eight members that have resigned um, where we finished with eight, the reasons for the resignation, um, just to get a no, sense we and understanding um, of why, what led to the resignation. And there, there, there has to be some um, explanation of having 13 members um, as opposed to the six currently. I'm not sure whether the six that is left is equal to fulfill the work that was done by 13. I'm not sure how is it structured, um, the board, whether you've got committees that uh, members served in. If that's the case, um, the logic dictates that those that were there previously were allocated certain responsibilities in terms of committees and subcommittees. Um, is the current arrangement still capable to produce similar results where you have six uh, people uh, unless uh, the minimum of three is able to achieve the desired outcome of what was meant to be done by 13. If I can get that um, explanation, Chair. But just reading from um, the situation, I doubt if uh, 13 people 
its work will be reduced to six. Um, in terms of the report, it says uh, the filling of the group chief executive and uh, chief financial officer will be concluded um, by October 2023. The standard acceptable time chair to fill any vacancies is three months. We understand that uh, for nine months you could not fill the vacancy because of financial challenges, but you are saying to us now um, you have resolved that. Um, now, if I look into what is acceptable in terms of uh, turnaround time to fill any vacancy, you're supposed to have concluded uh, the process by now, unless you have not started. Um, if you are targeting October, uh, the start time to give you three months will be August, from August, September, October. That's the acceptable uh, standard time or turnaround time to fill any vacancy. So I would like to get a sense and understanding of your project plan. What does your project plan look like? Because you can't just say October without having a table, the project plan approved by the board. Uh, these are the steps and it will take us uh, to October. So I would like to get an understanding of your project plan in relation to the appointments chair. Um, I am not an accountant. Uh, the issues of solvency and insolvent, um, I can't um, confidently claim to understand, but I want to just ask one question. Uh, from 2020, 2020 to 2021, uh, you were regarded as insolvent. You're saying the situation has changed. Uh, I would like to just ask a simple question in terms of the Companies Act Section 4. Whether or not have you passed the solvency and liquidity test? Uh, you are saying you are sitting comfortably in a solvency position. However, one would need to be satisfied in terms of Section 4 of the Companies Act, whether or not indeed you have passed uh, the solvency and liquidity test. I'm raising this chair because um, I think it's Section, sorry, <laughs> section 20 of Companies Act prohibits uh, companies from trading recklessly. Um, so for the past two years or so, you, you were trading recklessly. Have you dealt with that uh, uh, aspect of ensuring that your total assets and liability um, are in such a way that you are not found to be trading recklessly? If I can just get an understanding on, on, on those issues. I wouldn't want the chair also to debate issues of unaudited irregular expenditure. I'm skeptical of dealing with the um, irregular expenditure because they have not been audited. It will be a futile exercise. Uh, we, we get uh, information from the board side um, but because of one wanting to get answers, um, I would ask the question anyway, but with the understanding that your information is not audited, so it can be partially, it can be fully uh, 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 relied on check. I'm raising the issue on slide 27. Uh, on irregular expenditure for the financial year of 2023. Um, the tax clearance certificate uh, not obtained 
of uh, 10.1 million. If I heard correctly, is that there was a refusal to provide tax clearance. I don't know what were the reasons for such a refusal. Um, while you are saying uh, these uh, non-compliance cannot be characterized as uh, fraud and corruption, but if there are service providers who are willingly and deliberately refusing to pro provide you with tax uh, clearance, how do you characterize such? So the service provider, they do as they please. They are refusing to provide you with tax clearance. And instead of insisting of getting such, you sugarcoat it as no fraud and corruption. Um, can you explain to me why is such the case? Why there is a refusal? Um, in as much as it's not corrupt, but to me, um, there is a reason why uh, service providers will refuse to issue the, 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 the tax clearance certificate. And I'm not sure if I heard correctly, these are international service providers. I wonder if the same would have been uh, tolerated if it were inter, uh, local companies, if they were going to be allowed to be uh, continue doing business with uh, Dinell. So, Chair, um, because of you not allowing me to ask all my questions, let me check if you can I've, ask all of them just at the same time. Yes, yes, I'm I'm trying to check if I've. You can always come back for a second round. You of see, questions. I was avoiding that coming back. Che, my thought process has been um, dealt with, um, but it's fine. Che, I'll come back. Let me tick. All right, uh, let's get responses yeah, to thank you, um, those uh, questions. And I think one must underscore what you've raised. Um, when I was going through the presentation uh, in preparation for the meeting, until the audit has been done, mm -hmm. you must adopt a humble approach uh, to, the, to the irregular expenditure. Right, let's get responses to that. Okay, so uh, Triforce, uh, you will help us with the solvency and liquidity together with Tanega, and then uh, uh, Tammy to help us, we don't call them honorable, honorable Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> you, members. <laughs> yeah, you'll help uh, with the process of appointment and the, the three months question. On the one question that I can ask about, do the committees, if we are only six and we were 13, is the board functional? Does it, can it fill in the work and so on? I can respond and say, interesting enough, we have got all the committees. We've got the audit committee, we've got the HR committee, we've got the social and ethics committee. What it though means is that some board members are doing more than one committee. Most interesting, I have the strongest audit committee right now. And that is why we could be where we are. They've done more than being ARC committee of the board, and they've been much more helpful. So in terms of, uh, of the work itself, the board, there's no gaps, except we're overworking the same person sitting in the ARC committee and sitting in the Human Resources Committee or sitting in the Social Ethics Committee, but all the committees are actually in place and, and the work is being done. Uh, and I have no issue right now of the quality of the work that comes from that. Of course, they can do with relief in terms of having more board members so that they don't serve in two committees, they serve maybe in one committee especially the audit committee members, was a lot of work there uh, that comes. We've combined uh, audit and risk committee, for example, uh, and that's because we had to do so, given the 
But can I ask, uh, we have three, uh, statutory, we are required to have three. Yeah? The statutory, the, the statutory requirements is audit and social. The human resources committee is not a statutory one, but we need it because of the functionality of the board, especially because we have these uh, big assignments to make, including the nominations to the board that we suggest uh, to the social, to the, to the shareholder. But statutory committees are two. How many? I said three. I said three. Three. Yeah, yeah. I said three committees. Okay. Second colleagues, we're going to have to excuse Honorable Van Minen. She's got a constituency emergency of flooding because of the Cape Town rains that are um, ongoing. She's also just sent me pictures and the situation is quite dire. So um, we'll excuse her. Right, can we get, continue with the responses? Right. Uh, maybe then uh, Triforce help me with the uh, solvency and liquidity together with Tandega, and then uh, Jamie can help with the... Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, honorable members. The, in terms of the law, um, the board is supposed to do the assessment of liquidity and solvency at year end. So the 2022-2023 approved AFS for audit uh, to the Auditor General. That assessment is, was actually done. And um, currently, based on the recap, the amount that has been received, um, we can say um, we are fine. Uh, because the recap was done based on uh, what is required in order to be solvent and in order to be liquid so that you are able to meet future obligations uh, in that regard. I think uh, that's what the audit committee has approved. Uh, clearly, once the audit is done, um, the AG in providing opinion uh, could be able to uh, provide assurance or make their own findings uh, in that. Uh, Tandega, if you have additional um, detailed to... information, you can. <clears throat> um, Chair, I know on uh, first name basis, uh, we would really like to know who's who in terms okay. of position. Um, I know that, that's fine. That is no Mazamba line whom we refer to as such, but if we can just get to uh, Ma'am, your, your, your position. I know we've got the acting CFO. It helps with records. Um, my name is Triforza Ramanu. I'm the member of the board and the member of the audit and risk committee, uh, which is chaired by Ms. Siri Mukhabudu, who's not uh, in the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, through you, Chair, just um, in terms of the um, solvency and the critical position, as, as it said by Mas Romano, yes, the assessment has been done. And I think in the two years since 21-22, um, as indicated in the presentation, solvency also dealt with the restructuring of the balance sheets and dealing with the debt that Denal had in the intervening period. Um, in 2021-22, we've dealt with uh, about 3.1 3 billion of the debt, which further improved uh, the solvency uh, uh, position, as well as then the recap that was received in 2023, which shows the positive solvency position of, of 3 billion for the financial year ending in 2023. So in terms of the company's acts, as of 2023, our assets exceed our liabilities. Uh, and about, uh, if you're going to speak, rather do it yes, into the right. record, ne? because now we don't get these things you say. No, I wanted to no say, in, say in, in, yeah, yeah, no, in terms of Section 4, are they able to pay their debt when they become due? Their total assets, are they exceeding that total liability currently? Yes. Or are they just waiting for the bailouts to be paid in order for them um, to be able to 
deliver as such? Yeah, as of 2023, our assets exceed our liabilities. And based on the projections in terms of for the next 12 months for liquidity, we are able to meet our obligations as they become due for the next 12 months up until 2024. And let's conclude the responses and then um, Babum TV, you can take us through your presentation. No, I'm saying let's conclude the responses and then we'll go to the SIU. Yeah. So the chairman, I wanted to, on the irregular expenditure and the tax clearance, just yeah. give an example as to why would you have that? Because it's, it's a practical thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as, as indicated in the presentation, we had an OEM who is the only provider of seats for the aircraft. It is an international client. But our order value is far less than their client base, if I, if I may put it that. So when we place our order, uh, they, uh, I don't want to say refuse, but they have a less appreciation of our regulatory framework in providing tax clearances. Um, and therefore are reluctant to, to meet with our time frames. And at the same time, if we don't uh, take the orders from them, we are unable to deliver to our clients. So for instance, the Oryx, we provide support. This particular client provides seats for the Oryx. If we are unable to provide the Oryx, then the Oryx will be grounded, which is a far-reaching implications for the SANDF. So it, um, it, it, it is a balancing act that we, we, we would have to do we've had to take in terms of, of, of that. So they are bulldozing you because they're original equipment manufacturer and they're not willing to comply and you succumb to that. In, in essence, yeah. They're the sole provider. The, in terms of the seats for the Oryx, they're the only ones they provided in the world. Okay. I, I think, Chairman, the tax clearance certificate is our size, our South Africa. But if Airbus is not part of SARS things, so, but you need things from Airbus, whatever. <laughs> yes, what I'm saying is that uh, that's why they will then say there's no fraud, there's no corruption, but it's a practical thing. Airbus is for the French size, but we need their things, their space, their things. Yeah. Um, I think we, the, the, the issue of you know, multiple jurisdictions and yeah. it has been in certain instances problematic. We, yeah. I mean, just closer to home, you've got the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, which has been a massive headache for auditing. Yeah. Um, in so far as financial years, concurrence is concerned yeah. between South Africa and Lesotho. So those issues are there, but I think it's flagging them and then processes of condemnation um, <clears throat> with detailed and sufficient explanatory notes, which must assist the process, at the very least, to present them the, the, the dilemma. Because I think sometimes we will run into the risk of classifying things uh, and then they, they, they come out as an audit finding, yet they could have been yes, sufficiently yeah. explained. But I think there's due appreciation of the multiplicity of uh, jurisdictions. Yeah. So I think there's just one more question on the process, the three months thing, uh, Mr. Makazi. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and uh, good morning to members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tami Magazi. Uh, I'm the chairperson of the HR committee, and I also serve on the board. Um, I just wanted to take the committee just through a uh, high level uh, on the process um, that we follow. Uh, in fact, this would be management, and then it would come to uh, the committee itself. So I'll just run through. Um, uh, the one thing, though, I just put uh, as a preamble is that the positions we're looking at uh, being the group CE are critical positions, and we do not have an opportunity to take shortcuts or rush them. Second part is um, when we recruit for this position, especially at Dinell, we're looking for specialist service providers that will assist us. Um, uh, we have a lot of uh, headhunters in the market, 
but not everybody is qualified and has demonstrable, uh, should I say, uh, um, performance in recruiting for this position. So I'll just set that up as something that we keep in mind. Um, the process uh, is as follows. Um, we go to supply chain, uh, uh, DINEL, apply using their uh, own policies uh, to recruit for a headhunter. As I said, we're looking for a specialist headhunter. Uh, DINEL is in engineering and uh, it's manufacturing. Uh, you need somebody who has a certain specialist skill, high level of um, management, P running a profit and loss account, people management. So that's a brief that will come from the board because this is a board process. Uh, goes to SCM, they go. They will go out into either the newspapers and or other media platforms that they utilize to find uh, this kind of a person, um, uh, the recruiting agent, the headhunter, so to speak. So usually that process, the ad will go out and be out for 21 days. So my apology, Chair. I'm looking for a project plan. You are, you, you, all I'm expecting from you is to say the brief has started on the 21. It will conclude on this date. The ad will be out for, from the 6th until uh, this date, 21 days. That should be the plan that we are presenting approved by the board. You are just telling us a generic process without timelines, seeking to suggest that you have not tabled the plan before the board. We know what, what, what is entailed, but we wanted the project plan with dates to qualify the October deadline. Can you attach time frames <clears throat> to what you are saying? Uh, apologies, uh, 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 honorable member. Uh, I don't have that in front of me. And certainly, uh, I can get uh, management to provide that us uh, to us what we have as a committee that came uh, about two weeks ago has been sent back to management. Uh, so, uh, in terms of sent back, how because for uh, the short list that was provided to us, we had questions on it. Uh, in terms of the level of uh, demonstrable performance of those service providers. We've asked for them to go back into the market and look again and find us uh, qualified service providers. So if uh, the committee allows, uh, I could go back to management, uh, provide a written project plan that can be provided. Uh, so I apologize, I wasn't aware that no, 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 you, know, you wanted time frames and all of that, otherwise uh, certainly we would uh, do something like that. Okay, let's Thank get you. that uh, to us, but it's something that should be available, but now you've sent it back, which may then alter the timelines, but I think let's get that submission uh, done. Okay, I'm trying to go to SIU, um, I think, um, angling for that. I wanted to get the simple answer. Do you have an approved project plan with timelines? Approved by the board? Um, we don't have a, a project plan approved by the board. Uh, per se. Perhaps I don't understand so, the quite so, a question what, that uh, so where, you where are So where did asking. you get the date of October if you don't have a, a, a project plan? A project plan for you to appoint the group chief executive and you must know that you'll advertise on this date 20, 21 days will lapse on this date you will going to shortlist from this date to this date and you're going to start interviews and uh, you're going to do assessment so you can't just work without having a plan because you you, you know uh, uh, what you need to do you must have a plan um, uh, and you uh, must know that the board meeting will sit on this date to approve uh, the, 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 the recommended names. Okay. I think he's got you. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, the honorable uh, member that we present that, uh, make a submission to yourself, uh, Chair. No, because that, I do not have it ready here with me. That, that, that's not the question. Yes. Uh, it does exist in the yeah. company. As I say, uh, uh, to use your own words, Chair, it changes the timelines. We had a project plan, but now we've sent back 
this stuff. Don't, and don't use my words because you'll use them out of context. I said I would imagine that because of you sending it back, the question is, do you have it? There is a plan that was presented to uh, the HR committee. Right, wait. No, they're pulling it out. Wait. Yes. Nay, hold on. All right. Yes. Ma'am. Okay, yeah, let's the, hold yeah. that whilst he goes through it. The management has pulled it for him. Um, he will present it to us shortly. I think yeah. he was still... That's not all of it. No, that's, that's, not, that's not it. Mm. <laughs> you see, the issue is this. The, 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 I would imagine the appointment of a CEO right, is something which, if I'm involved in it, I must have it at my fingertips. I say this in this context. Parliament is currently engaged in a process to appoint the next public protector. And I was reading their project plan um, just last week. When it adverts are going out, for how long? When it will go out for public comment? You see, there was, I, I, I was take, I'm not a member of that committee, but I, I, I know exactly when it will go and when it will come to the House. I think that's what Honorable had, because you are appointing a CEO. All right, Madam Chair? And then can, I, can I say, Chairman, the, 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 the October 23 is the board ideal deadline date, also based on as the honourable member says, it takes three months to do this. Where we are, um, PFMA subjects you to a supply chain that even as a board, we have to say, we switch on this, it's not going to happen because these people are not the appropriate people for these jobs. And so you'll find that as part of the plan, we have to fit in into that panel of the supply chain, otherwise we come back here with, I can't remember, wrong process things. If not, we ask for uh, the shareholders' support to get outside of the supply chain and fit into the supply chain. All I'm saying is that it sounds to me like the committee is trapped between the supply chain process, the PFMA process, it must qualify and comply. At the same time, it must do the right thing and the timing is that of October 23. That is what I'm hearing. But uh, you see, <clears throat> Treasury Note 3 gives you as a entity and the accounting authority the ability to deviate and then be able to explain. So you can't be trapped because the mechanisms are in place which enable you to expand and to deviate. And I think the CFO is agreeing with you. So the National Treasury Note 3 at your disposal. We don't like it, but it's there. So that's one. Two, if the board has said October 2023, the committee responsible must then work backwards from that date to say we must arrive at the board's deadline and then say how, and then set the mechanisms in place and processes in place. If they've got a problem, they must come back to the board and say your deadline is not practical. And until they've done that, so all I'm saying is that in response to your chair, the, there's Treasury Note 3 and I qualify it, we don't like it, but it's at your disposal for you to utilize to respond to the trap of PFMA and other processes. So I think that that's where I am on that one, Honorable Suwea, and then Madam Chair, you can come in and I think we can dispense with this issue to say it will be submitted and Babum Tib, sorry, we will come to you. No, thank you, Chair. I, I wanted to advise the board that there is no need of, of wanting to somersault that you don't have the plan and that you can always go back and review and have a plan. That's what I wanted to say. 
unlike some assaulting, we have no, we don't have, we say they must go back. It doesn't, it doesn't project you correctly. It, it, it doesn't look good. There's nothing wrong in saying we don't have, and can we just go and review your deadline? Yeah. I think, Chairman, the board has a timetable, October 23. That's number one. Two, we have already taken that to the shareholder about the supply chain, and I think as the chair is saying, that has been the advice. You can deviate, but make us, uh, what is the word, approve. And that is the only difference. So October 23 is the board date, seeing that as it, we speak today, they have not started. What should have been done in, done in April or May or whatever, when we're looking for money. So yeah, the deadline of October 23 is not two thumbs up, and we have already spoken to the shareholder about give us the approval to get out of that supply chain and do the right thing. That is what we say. Right, we will get that uh, timeline just now. Babum TV, can we come to you please? Well, I think they were busy with, they were pulling it out there, and so I'm saying let's manage time and get the SIU. I think there was a conversation there from my observation. Uh, apologies, Chair, uh, that is not the document, so okay. I will ask that we make a submission, because this is not it. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yes. yeah. yeah. yeah it's, we, yeah, I had already said yes, we'll prepare yeah. and send it, because it's not here, we don't have it here. So. No, you see, uh, Bob Marcus, I'm trying to rescue you. Uh, and then every time you keep your <laughs> is, is it not here or it's not there? It, it is not there, uh, Chair. Right. Yes. Yeah, you that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I know what they will say if you say it's not here. They will yeah. say, no, no, oh. no, whilst the SIU presents, Call head office and you see if you see soon. No. I know that's what they will say. No. Right. So I'm saying I'm a good rescue. So if it's not there, uh, our deadline is a seven days submission. So today is, is Wednesday. We can be flexible because we're going to oversight. Anything that needs a written response, Friday close of business next week is fine. We usually say seven days, but because we're out next week, can be flexible and then Friday close of business because the committee's got a special meeting for two days in July as well to do this. All right, Babu Mtib. No, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, and Honorable Members, can we request our presentation to be reflected, please? Yes. Yes. Operation between Tenel and SIU and, uh, yeah, all right. Um, um, IT? Ngelan onye se le ingatlanga tla ze zgama bona gutilap. Unga ikti shi kanye se mfawagit. No, thank you, Honorable Chair. I see the presentation is up there now. If we can probably just page on. Presentation outline. Well, I'm, just... I'm sorry. So the colleagues, the board members got another meeting she must connect to. So she is asked to 
um, stay out, but there are board members who are here. So there's just explanation as to why I should be leaving. Um, she's got another meeting. Um, thank you very much, ma'am, for your attendance. Appreciate it. All right, but we'll take over to you. Yes, yes, yes. Use, use happy. Use happy, see. No, thank you, Honourable Chair and uh, Honourable Members, uh, DM and the Chair of the Board. Um, the presentation outline, I think, is clear. Um, uh, we've circulated the presentation before. We'll go to, if you can just page on, please. Uh, the legislative mandate, again, we will not go through it. The next slide as well, the methodology and skills. And then the next slide is about the consequence management, really the outcomes. I want to spend a few minutes on this, given what, what has been discussed uh, uh, during the general presentation. Um, and honorable chair and honorable members, um, you'll, when we present, you'll realize that uh, the investigation is largely, is largely completed. And we will be going through some of the uh, findings and the outcomes. Now, this consequence management, uh, particularly on the civil litigation part, because there's a number of civil litigation matters that we will be indicating, either consulting with counsel and so on. Uh, so that part is really to ensure that we recover monies that uh, Dinell has lost, has lost, and we are enjoined by law to do that. Uh, amongst others, uh, listening to some of the presentation is that when we become aware that uh, some employees resign in the face of a disciplinary process and there's evidence pointing to them, if we become aware timely, then we're able to institute processes to freeze the pensions, uh, which we have done in, uh, in, other, in other instances. Uh, on the civil litigation part as well, uh, we include those employees who are no longer employed, but the evidence uh, indicates that they were implicated in the process. Um, and that takes me now to the second uh, block, which is the disciplinary action. You'll see in the main, in the presentation, in, in, in some of the instances, we will indicate that the employees are no longer, or, or no action can be taken because the employees are no longer at Dinell. And that is the result of the labor relations law, that when you are no longer an employee, we can't take disciplinary action. But as I indicate, that when there's evidence indicating that uh, the person played a role in the loss of the uh, state institution, Dinell in this case, we will include them in the civil litigation process, we'll cite them in the papers, uh, but they will also be uh, included when there's uh, criminal evidence pointing to them. This is the next block now on the referral for, to NPA for prosecution. So the fact that they've left uh, does not exonerate them uh, from other, uh, other actions. I think it's important to underscore that. Um, now, the issue of the previous previous uh, board members as well, I think it's important to, to emphasize that when we take actions, well, firstly, if there's evidence indicating that uh, there has been uh, uh, evidence indicating wrongdoing on the part of the board, whether negligence or any other, any other infraction, uh, in the civil litigation part, we also cite them uh, as respondents so that the, they are held to account as well. And that would also include considerations for uh, instituting uh, delinquency, delinquency actions. I think it's important to note that. Um, so uh, on, the, on the extreme right, there's various uh, regulatory uh, and, uh, referrals that we do uh, ordinarily in investigations. Uh, in this investigation in particular, there might be some other referrals that we consider. Uh, uh, to other regulations, uh, regulators, uh, including, including in some of those uh, international issues that we are settled with at the moment. Now, the, at the bottom there is the systemic recommendations which we do. 
Uh, and, and at the stage where the investigation is and the findings, uh, we're hoping that uh, when we focus on the maladministration and the, uh, and the governance part, uh, we will present the outcomes to the accounting authority and that they could uh, uh, you know, use those inputs uh, for considering as part of implementing the turnaround, turnaround uh, strategy. The next slide, I'll go into the background now for this investigation. This investigation, as we indicated before, it emanates from a complaint received by the SIU uh, about October 2018, uh, and some of these uh, allegations emanated from the audit, audit findings of 2018-2019, uh, because we do do that. Uh, when I listened to the presentation in, in, a, in terms of the irregular expenditures and so on, so we'll continue to look at the audit reports and see if there's any uh, need uh, to pursue uh, investigation on, on all of those. Based on these allegations, we then uh, drafted a motivation which was of course signed, uh, which was published in July 2019 to investigate certain allegations uh, in relation to the affairs of Dinell. In the same year, uh, the, there were allegations which were not covered by the initial scope of the proclamation. We then uh, uh, approach the president so that the proclamation can be uh, extended. Uh, as, as proclamation indicates, uh, the SIU is authorized to investigate serious malpractice or maladministration into the affairs of, the, of, of Dinell, uh, which have taken place between the period of 1 January 2015 and the date of publication of the proclamation, which was the 8th of November 2019. And now there's a very important provision after that, is that we could look at matters before the 1st of January 2015 or after the 8th of November 2019, uh, uh, if they are connected uh, with or incidental or ancillary to the matters mentioned in the schedule. Now, in terms of the terms of reference, which are included in the, in the schedule of the proclamation, which is the next slide, thank you. In terms of this schedule, uh, SIU investigation focuses on the following six key areas. The procurement or contact contracting for information technology uh, security assessment services. The procurement or contracting for services to develop a white paper for a funding model. Uh, and the procurement or contracting for legal services. Uh, the procurement or or contracting for steel fabrication services and steel fabricated goods, the awarding of buzzeries uh, by Dinell, uh, and unlawful, irregular, or unapproved measures or practices in relation to the misappropriation of proprietary and intellectual property rights in Dinell air-to-air missiles, standoff weapons, surface target missiles, air defense, and unmanned aerial vehicle system. As I indicated, we're going to be touching on all of this, uh, but at this stage, perhaps just upfront, Chair, to comment uh, on the IP issue, and you'll see when we come to that already, there's a finding. Uh, yes, indeed, I mean, we've engaged with the, with the board in terms of the need, and we will keep them informed when we prepare the civil litigation process uh, so that the business needs and the needs to take action, uh, there's, a, there's a consideration there. Uh, Chair, uh, uh, we looked at uh, some of the areas that are that in, in the investigation section of the Dinell presentation. Uh, all, of those, all of those matters uh, really are covered by, by our, our investigation. Uh, Chair, I'll hand over now when, to go into the actual findings of the investigation and, uh, and, and outcomes. I'll hand over to Ms. Kesebe, who is the lead investi investigator in this, uh, in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, good afternoon, Chair, uh, committee members, um, the Deputy Minister, the Chairperson of the Board, um, Advocate Motivi and colleagues. <clears throat> I'm starting with the procurement of the ICT security assessment services. 
Chairperson, you've already indicated that we must just touch on the selling matters. Um, we are, this investigation is complete, but what I can just mention as a way of background, this emanated from a, 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 a potential partnership that, that Danel was, was, was envisaging with two foreign countries on an ICT project. And um, obviously then they were looking at capacitating um, Danel in terms of then, uh, the IT skills. And this is where then they got uh, 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 someone that they was running as a project manager who then sourced uh, some of these IT companies and there was no procurement process. Um, the, the group CEO of the, the former group CEO would then meet with them and, 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 uh, and, and agree to certain terms. In this particular one that is part of our motivation and the proclamation, um, uh, the company and the group CEO, they met and they agreed uh, that the company will submit a proposal. And then on the signature on, of, on, on that proposal, then it was then agreed that it will be the approval. So the terms of that agreement then was uh, in, in, contained in that proposal. And 70%, uh, actually the 100% advance payment was part of the, the proposal which was agreed by the group CEO. And this matter was not tabled before the board, before the approval. And, um, and then after the, then the, 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 the proposal was signed, then the company started demanding the 100% advance payment and some negotiations started, and um, Danelle was then prepared to pay 70%, which was then done. Uh, considering the, the magnitude of this project, uh, because it was um, uh, to assess the vulnerability of Danelle as an entity in terms of cyber attacks. So they ought to have at least involved the state, the state security agency, which was not involved at the time. So the company then presented to uh, the, 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 the leadership of Danelle at the time, and, uh, and then they started demanding the outstanding 30%, which Danelle then demanded uh, the final report before releasing the 30%. Um, that then ended up in a, in a litigation process and uh, Danel defended this and obviously they raised a special plea on, on, jurisdiction, on, on, on jurisdictional issues um, uh, and, and, and also an, a counterclaim um, of that 4.6 million which was paid by Danel. Basing the effect on the basing the effects on the fact that the report was not yet submitted to Danel, and this is the stance that we are supporting as the SIU. Um, Chairperson, maybe just like just to bring you forward, we we interacted with the company, interviewed the CEO of the company, and the company was prepared to supply to provide Danel with that report assessment report and also to abandon the 1.9 million rent uh, claim. However, the view of the SIU in this regard is that that report would be stale because that would have been the assessment that was done in 2015 and would not, would not have any bearing in the current uh, status of, of the company now. So we then advised Danel to pursue this matter because at that stage, um, uh, the Danel was facing these uh, liquidity issues and they didn't have money to proceed, but now we are pleased, Chair, that the process is in, 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 a, in an advanced stage. Um, the, the, the council appointed by Danel is already appointed an expert to deal with this matter, and um, we are going to join uh, 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 the, the, the process at, the, at an appropriate stage. We are considering, uh, as a possible recovery, 
we are considering that 1.9 million rent, that would be a saving for Janelle because they don't have to pay that, and, and, and then to recover the 4.6 million. So that process is now awaiting the process of uh, the expert report, and then we'll move forward from there. At this stage, Chairperson, there are no uh, criminal referrals and uh, there, there are no uh, disciplinary because the implicated officials left the employee of Donnell. The next one is the development of the white paper for the funding model. As, as Advocate Motibi has indicated, uh, this one uh, was more to get a company to assist Danel to unlock certain funding from, um, from um, either PIC or uh, from Treasury or from, uh, from the guarantees that uh, Danel had with AMSCO. So the issue, the, 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 the allegation was that there was no competitive bidding process that was followed in the process of appointing the company. Um, our findings are that there was a process that was, that was followed, um, there was a deviation that was approved, and, um, and then the, 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 the company that was appointed was appointed on the basis of that deviation, and therefore there are no irregularities that we found in this process. Now we move to then the appointment of legal services. The specific, there is a specific company that, uh, that we are looking at in terms of this, because uh, the allegation was that this firm was um, uh, working very close to the former chairperson of the board, and it was not even listed on the Daniels database of, of, of legal services at the time. The value of the payments the, in terms of the expenditure reports um, uh, from Janel, the com this company has been paid in excess of 10 million rand. The investigation is also complete, Chair. Uh, yes, we uh, identified irregular procurement processes um, in the appointment of this company, and there was no contractual agreement signed with the company the fees between the Danel and this company were negotiated outside the normal SCM. And also the, the, the project or maybe the, the contract was managed between the chairperson of the board and the GCEO at the, the time. Um, our investigation has revealed that um, there was misrepresentation and a fraud on the part of the legal firm. We also identified fraudulent invoices to the tune of 65,000 rent issued by the firm and paid by Danel for alleged claim by council without his knowledge. We have already obtained an affidavit from the council, the advocate who then uh, uh, advised us that um, this company director actually approached him for this and claiming that it was an oversight from his side. So he refused to, to, to budge. We also identified fraudulent double billing for, um, uh, for, for, for an amount totaling 425,000. We also identified that there was also a theft of funds um, in the amount of 290,000 that was withdrawn from the trust account um, of the uh, and, 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 and of the of the of the of this legal firm and transferred to the business account. So, in terms of this one, we are looking at um, referring the account to the taxing committee of legal practices, and we also um, are referring this matter. We've already referred it to our as a CLU for the civil recovery of seven hundred and eighty thousand rand. There is a criminal referral for fraud, as well as then the disciplinary referral in terms of the legal practice council, um, as well as possible administrative action against the accounting authority in terms of the Companies Act. That is the, the CIPC referral that we are currently working on in collaboration with the, the, the Danel as well as DPE. Then I move to um, uh, the, the three contracts that were signed 
with the company that, that is um, linked to the Gupta's chairperson. <clears throat> um, this company chair acquired the majority shares from a company that had previously dealt with Denel. Then this, the acquisition of these major shares and property was then concluded in December 2013. Why I'm mentioning this then is because it will be relevant in, my, in, my, in my, my, my next slide. So during the years preceding the aforementioned sale, this company traded with Danel. However, the combined contracts did not exceed 13 million rent per annum. Then after the sale, then um, the value of contracts awarded to the service provider exponentially increased from 39 million rent, that is 2014, to 75 million rent per annum thereafter. The, the, this was as a result of the HALS contract that was awarded to this company and two memorandum of agreements that were signed between uh, two divisions of Danel and this company. This whole process, Chair, it is very important to mention that this process started as early as 2014. So in this slide now, it depicts then the value of contracts from, year, year, from the years 20, uh, 20, 2009 to 2017. If you look at then the, 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 the slides, you, you'll see that uh, from 2014, we started to see this like growth in terms of the, the value of contracts that were awarded to the companies. Okay, thank you, Chen. So the Hulls contract, this is a contract chair that emanated, maybe let me, let me start to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, um, with the background. Around 2007, AMSCO um, was in the process of um, rolling out a tender for a number of variants uh, 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 because they needed uh, to, um, uh, to at least have, it was an opportunity for them to have uh, these variants um, uh, of, 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 of vehicles uh, uh, manufactured. But it, it, it was a big project because it had to start from, you know, the design uh, up until then, you know, pre-production up until then the, the, the manufacturing, the production and, and also delivery. So, uh, this HALS contract emanated from the contract with then AMSCO. So during 2014, the former GCEO of, um, of, of Danel appointed a Gupta-linked service provider for the manufacturing of different variants of um, uh, who faced their vehicle HALS, despite the, the strategic requisition of LMT by Denel for manufacturing of the Hufestas. LMT was uh, one of the subsidiaries of Denel, which was appointed um, uh, specifically and for the sole purpose of assisting Denel in this project, because this project was awarded to Denel around 2007. So in late 2014 and, and early 2015, in addition to the contract that was awarded in 2014, there were two memorandum of agreements that were concluded appointing the same service provider as a single source supplier for DLS as well as DVS for all steel fabrication and steel fabricated goods. And the contract was for 10 years. No value was attached to these contracts. This process was found to be irregular. These were open-ended contracts. Whenever they needed uh, 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 steel fabricated <coughs> services or steel fabricated goods, they would simply go to this in terms of, um, in terms of this uh, memorandum of agreements. 
The two memorandum of agreements were approved by the then acting GCEO, even though the group supply chain executive had declined the recommendation of the, DLX, of, of the DLS Exco to appoint the service provider. All processes then to appoint the service provider on three of these contracts were irregular and the adjudication scores for the HALS contract, now this one goes back to the HALS contract, the scores were manipulated to favor the service provider. How the scores were, manu were manipulated, they were manipulated in terms of the threshold. You know, all other pro service providers will be awarded a score of 20 out of 45, but this company was awarded a score, for an example, of 50 out of 45. So, which then uh, reflects then that the, the scores were manipulated. The service provider is currently under business rescue. Okay. The service provider is currently under business rescue as we speak. However, this same service provider has obtained default and execution judgments against Denel as a result of certain, uh, certain breaches in terms of these contracts and unpaid debt. So on those basis then, Chair, we then felt that, you know, if then they have the local standing to litigate against Danel, then we can also litigate against them. So in terms of then our outcomes, um, uh, there is already a, a senior counsel that is appointed by the SIU uh, to litigate um, against uh, this company. Why we want to litigate against this company is that whilst we have at this stage not identified any fraud, but the LMT, which was the subsidiary of Denel, in terms of all the processes, had it not been the manipulation of the scores, then LMT would have been the successful bidder for this contract. So we want to then litigate and see if we can't recover then the difference between LMT's quoted prices and what was quoted by this company from the executives themselves, and also consider then uh, uh, looking at uh, profits from the company that was then appointed. We have referred evidence pointing to the commission of criminal offense in, against seven um, former members of Denel. Uh, the group as well as then the DLS being then the division of Denel to NPA. This is also part of then the State Capture Commission and, and our findings Chair, are consistent with the findings of the State, of the, of the state Capture Report. Um, in terms of disciplinary referrals, uh, Christine, all those... Can I ask you to 320 oh. kilometers per hour? Uh, I'm, I'm saying the presentation is comprehensive, and I'm saying please take it as read and cover the salient points. Thank and you, I'm Chair. Just trying to bonus cut state at the Sierra Mal and Jaganga. Thank you, Chair. I think that will that is helpful. Okay. So we referred two refer uh, disciplinary referrals, one to SAA and one to Danel, uh, in terms of then some of the former employees that, uh, that uh, uh, are there, that, that those referrals have already been uh, referred. Then in terms of then the other who faced the contracts, Danel then re realized at, at some point, I think it was around 2021, um, that, you know, they have not, um, uh, uh, there are issues with regards to the entire who faced the contracts around the 30 companies that were appointed for this. So where then they referred this to us and we are looking into this. This investigation has just started, but what I can highlight here, Chair, is that we have now um, uh, uh, been advised by some of the members from DLS that certain crucial documents were destroyed. Then I move to the chart contract. I'm not going to bore you with the background, but there are three uh, salient points in terms of this uh, contract. Um, we are looking at then the appointment of um, a company uh, that was uh, going to deliver the donor trucks from China, the Sino, uh, the Sino truck drive train chaser. So um, this company was paid an advance payment of, um, of, of, of um,
Oh, sorry. No, this is, this is VR, Lisa, sorry. The, um, the company that, we are, that I'm, I'm referring to now is the company that was paid 15 million rand, um, <laughs> that was paid to the same Gupta-linked company, which was supposed to then uh, um, uh, 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 assist Denel in, 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 the, in the completion of that contract with the Chad government. However, that company then demanded 15 million rand in outstanding fees, and then 15 million rand was then paid out of the Chad contract to this company, and the company refused to even sign the, 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 the order that was generated by Denel. Then the, the other one, this, uh, I, I'm, I apologize for the, the misalignment. Uh, the other one is that the company that was appointed for the donor fund, uh, sorry, for the, for the donor um, uh, chases, which was the uh, uh, Sinotrack um, uh, that, that had to be uh, procured from China. These donor vehicles were going to be used as platforms for these armored vehicles, as, re as requested by the Chadians. The SIU found that the appointment of this company was irregular because the submission for the deviation was based on misrepresentation. Uh, the, uh, the company was paid, again, 13 million rand out of the chart um, uh, 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 contract amount. And uh, it must be noted that no contract existed between DLS and as well as the service provider. One single track was delivered to Denel um, as part of that. So we are also referring this one for the, for the recovery of the 12 million rent. And then we have identified evidence pointing to um, uh, criminality against seven entities and individuals. And that is currently under um, our, our legal review. The implicated officials, they left Denel. Then the, then the other one is then the, the TA, the appointment of the technical advisor. I think then the interim GCO pointed to this one. Um, uh, the, all the processes that um, led to then the payment of that was irregular. And uh, none of the policy uh, uh, prescripts were followed by the GCEO. And we are also referring that for the, for the, for the recovery of that 9 million. But then it is important, Chair, to point out that this company is in Hong Kong. And then uh, it's also going to be um, one of those foreign entities that will be difficult to, um, to, to, um, to litigate against because we need to then invoke certain, certain um, uh, treaties. Then we move to the, the awarding of bursaries. When we received this one chair, already the, um, um, the SAPS was already involved. They were all, the matter was already reported to the SAPS, and there were three bursaries. What I can highlight here, chair, is that it already um, in one instance, an AOD of 559 was already signed, and the data has already paid in excess of 457,000 rand. Um, no disease because um, uh, the officials left Danelle. Then the second one, uh, it's, a, it's a claim of 234. It's a second student um, uh, who also was not successful in the program. And uh, in that, they, we issued a letter of demand, and uh, then summons were, were served on, on this, and then we are currently applying for a default judgment. The third one, Chair, there is no, um, there is no in, in intention to, to, um, to move forward with this one, because this is one student who was successfully completed um, the course, and uh, the only issue here was that uh, his fees were then paid out of then the other students without the approval of Denel. Denel is then, we are engaging with Denel in terms of then the recovery of the, the funds there. But in all material um, instances, Denel was informed by the company, by this aviation school, that they, this is what they are planning to do, but Denel did not respond to any of the correspondence. Then, um, then, then, then I'm moving to then the IP, um, which is our last focus area. 
Chairperson, here we have uh, the SAMI. Uh, in this instance, there were meetings that were held outside of the, um, the, the approved um, uh, uh, delegation. And, and therefore, we, and then there were documents that were signed, that were shared with this, the, the officials of the SAMI. However, from the ones that we have seen through emails, the, the information that was electronically shared, there's only one document that was uh, uh, considered confidential. Um, uh, uh, other documents that were shared in secret meetings, we don't know what are those, but it would seem that you know there were meetings that were held with the government, with the government, um, uh, uh, the semi-government outside the approved um, uh, uh, official um, structures of tenure. The next one is then the one with the UAE. In this one, Chairperson, um, uh, please allow me to just spend a little bit of time here because it's very serious. What happened here, the UAE Air Force at the time, this is just the background, the UAE Air Force, they, they, they wanted some uh, smaller missiles that were, uh, you know, like the smaller target, you know, like target focused missiles. And, and, and they wanted to issue a tender for this one. And because Danel at that stage had this um, a, 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 a joint venture with the Tower Zoom, uh, and, and there was this agreement, uh, the partnership agreement, and then the, 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 the entity called Tower Zoom Dynamics at the time. So they, 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 there was this strategic view that maybe the Tower Zoom Dynamics should be the, the company that would tender for this one because it was a lucrative uh, contract for uh, both um, Danel as well as Tower Zoom um, in the UAE. So then they approached Danel um, to say, Danelle, can we have a contract uh, where we are going to uh, maybe uh, develop two of your missiles, which is then the P2 and the P3. I'm just going to focus on those ones uh, because that's, this is where we are having a, an issue. So then, uh, then there was this contract between the two entities, which is Tower Zoom Dynamics as a joint venture and Danelle, for them to develop this uh, these two missiles. Um, according to then uh, uh, the, 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 the contract of the, of the development contracts, so Danel was going to be paid four million US dollars for both these missiles at the time. Um, the contract then stipulated that after then the development, the Tower Zoom Dynamics, which is the joint venture, would then um, uh, uh, own the foreground IP of this developed missiles for both P2 and P3. So, um, Danel, looking at now uh, revenue generation, I mean, revenue streams that will flow from then the sale of these from the UAE in terms of the joint venture where they were owning 49%, as well as then, then the money, the, the, mon the income that was coming through a development contract, because capability in terms of then the development would come from Danel. But the background for both P2 and P3, I mean uh, P2 and P3 contract uh, missiles, was, remained then the, the property of the South African government. So after then the process was finalized, then Tower Zoom Dynamics then demanded that the foreground IP then be uh, transferred to them. And the IP was flagged correctly by Danelle to say this is the foreground, this is the background. And, and after that then there was a resolution, 5 of, 20, uh, of, of Jul 21, Jul June 2015. In terms of that resolution now, uh, Danelle only became aware of this resolution around 2019, 2020. They were, all, that, all the time, they were not aware of this resolution. And in terms of this resolution, so um, uh, 
the Denel representatives from the TD agreed that the foreground IP that would have ended up in the hands of the Tawazun Dynamics, the joint venture, be transferred to Tawazun, which is the holding company from the other hand, in return for the loan that was uh, given to, um, to Tawazun Dynamics for the development. None of this was di disclosed to Denel, and Denel didn't, it was not aware of this. Whilst then the shareholder representative signed this resolution, um, uh, 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 we, we are confident, uh, we've looked at the documents, Daniel was not aware of this. And after the transfer of then the IP to Tawazun, then Tawazun sold its shares to um, a sister company called Edic. So which means then Tawazun removed itself from the joint venture totally with this IP where Danel actually owned 49%. And then after that, then, then the, 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 when the Air Force tender was issued, then Tawazun Dynamics was instructed not to submit a tender, tender for, the, for, the, for, the, for that contract. And Halcon, which is another sister company of the Tawazun, then tendered for this contract. So Halcon was then awarded the, the, the tender and Tawazun had transferred the foreground IP to Halcon at that stage. Then Halcon then entered into a production contract with Denel because now they were the owner of the foreground IP, but they didn't have the background. So they had to come back to Denel because Denel owned the background. Then after that production contract, then, then uh, then uh, the IP was then transferred to Halcon. We requested the SEP data download reports and uh, for analysis and the, then uh, a team, we have identified that data packs were downloaded from Danel's at, 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 at subsystem and this was in respect of P2 and P3 as well as other measles that were also transferred. And that was also downloaded, sorry, Che. Then I moved to then uh, the, the, the another IP, which is RG35. This one, um, uh, this uh, IP emanated from, um, uh, the, the, from BAE system. This was like one of the, um, the vehicles that was uh, owned by um, the BAE system. When, um, when Danelle acquired LSSA, at the time, which is BAE system. You know, the motivation as well as the valuation was based on the revenue streams that would have been generated from then the, this, the, the, this uh, RG35. But shortly after then the acquisition on 3rd of June, August 2015, um, then the, there was an agreement to sell, to sell then the IP and the hardware to uh, NIMA, which is also a company from UAE, which is a sister to these other companies that I've referred to um, as Supra. So there were also additional contracts that were lined up in terms of this contract. And um, the, the person who signed on behalf of Denel was an employee of Denel who, um, who had no delegation um, to sign such, uh, such contracts. And then after then the signing of this contract, this employee resigned from Danel and he's currently the CEO of NIMA and he's the one who's currently demanding this IP from Danel. So Chair, um, uh, I'm just going to touch on the maladministration part. We, are, we, have, uh, we have touched uh, a, 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 a lot on this one now in terms of Looking at the governance uh, and the maladministration uh, uh, within Danel, we've interviewed a number of crucial people in this space who have assisted us in terms of this uh, aspect. However, we want to finalize all the focus areas before we get into these ones. Um, mainly what we want to identify is the cause of failure of governance structures at Danel, the individuals that are responsible, the process 
uh, that we are going to embark on, it will also be then covering the, the, the establishment of the, D, the Danel Asia business, the acquisition of LSSA and the funding related to the acquisition. The reason for us to look into that is because um, when we were investigating the who faced to contract, whilst we investigating the who faced a contract, we identified that some money from that project was, that was ring fence for that project, was used as a guarantee for the acquisition of that company, and 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 it was ultimately used by uh, to to settle then the outstanding balance there. We are also looking at the relationship between Danel and its subsidiary, uh, especially uh, LMT, and we are also looking at other key decisions affecting Danel. Um, we are also looking at how the failures contributed to the current position, and also make systemic recommendations. Uh, update on the state capture chairperson. Um, there were four matters that were covered in our proclamation uh, that are related to the state capture. Three matters um, uh, in terms of our investigations are finalized. The outcome that, uh, that has already been achieved is that we referred seven NPA referrals, two disciplinary referrals, uh, two matters were referred uh, for civil recovery. That would be the, the VR laser as well as then the IP. Um, summary of outcomes, then that is just what we've achieved thus far. And I'm not going to touch on the, 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 the income statements and the position of Denel now because then there's this progressive report that has been reported. But um, I think it is uh, important to note that we are concerned about the irregular expenditure um, as well, especially when it comes to that 55% of it being uh, the non-compliance to, to, um, to, to PFMA. Then we are collaborating with other state institutions, uh, especially in the law enforcement, and then we also are collaborating and we're having discussions with HESA in terms of uh, what uh, they, they are currently uh, doing. Um, Chair, then these are just observations due to state capture some members of the accounting authority, including ex-officio members, failed in their fiduciary duties to properly manage the financial affairs of the institution. The accounting authority failed to defend Denel against litigation from VR Laser and or other, uh, uh, other entities that were doing business with Denel. The accounting authority uh, is required to implement SIU recommendations. We, do, we currently uh, we are in, 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 in liaison with the board, and uh, so far I think the relationship is good. The investigation team is also going to cover aspects of maladministration and report the same in greater detail. Consequent management will be reviewed uh, con continuously in order to determine if Danel adheres to systemic recommendations for improvement. So those are the only risks that we have, uh, Chair, and that brings um, our presentation to the end, and I thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ooh, sorry about that. Thank you very much. All right, Home TV, any concluding remarks on your part from the SIU side? Thank you very much, Mr. Klasiv. Thank you. Uh, just quick, uh, under the observations, uh, honorable chair and honorable members, uh, the slide before the risks one, I think it's important to note and indicate that uh, the first bullet points referring to the accounting authorities, the, the failure by the accounting authorities is accounting authorities at the time. Uh, so this is the board at the time or at the period at which we found uh, irregularity. So I think it's very clear. The third bullet point, of course, uh, may probably be referring to the current uh, board, in terms of which when we make uh, referrals, uh, we will engage with them and we would expect that uh, you know, uh, our, our recommendations uh, be, be implemented. I think that's the, that's the difference uh, that I wanted to just indicate. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a very cogent differentiation um, was when I went through it, I was thinking the, the same as well because uh, the chairperson earlier on, I laughed, she was very, we, not this board, we are not under investigation. So I'm glad that you've cleared them. So when I went through it as well, I was like, yay. Right, <clears throat> yeah, but I think what comes out of the SIU 
uh, report is the extent to which the collapse of systems creates a conducive and an enabling environment for people to be corrupt. And two, when individuals become the institution and the systems, there's heightened manipulation um, of process. So I think that on its own comes out as something to guard against. And so I think there's progress in that regard. And I suppose some of the issues will be read against uh, the audits, the three audits which are currently before the AG and they will provide a particular sense um, of, 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 of clarity for us, right? Colleagues, briefly, anything going once, going twice? All right, Honorable Siwe, Honorable Hattebe. Thank you, Chair. Um, what do you, simplify it for me, what do you mean when you say Gupta linked companies? It would be the VR laser company. Okay. Honorable Hattebe, I think it's the clarity that's needed in light of yesterday's debate as well in the House and so far as the failed extradition. So it sort of ensures that uh, we strengthen the case as to why that extradition is important. Um, right. Honorable uh, Hattebe, and if you look at the amounts involved here, uh, Honorable Hattebe. Thanks, Chair. Let's welcome the report. Uh, Simple and straightforward. But as I was listening, Chair, I'm, I'm interested in knowing um, these um, officials that have left. Um, for an example, the the pilot bursary, um, more than one student. Are you referring to the same officials, different um, awards? Yes, Chairperson, it, it was um, same officials that dealt with this, and, um, and, and, and the awards were done in the same year. All right. Thanks. It's a pity there are no number of officials. Um, how many are you referring to and say implicated officials? Okay, Chairperson, I think it will be mainly the former GCEO and then the former CCFO. And we are looking at then the accounting authority as the, as, as the people that are oh, okay. responsible for the financial affairs. So, so will that be the same on the, the, the chat, is it chat contract on slide 18, 17? Yes, Chairperson, the, the chart contract was also concluded around the same period uh, by the same uh, officials, but the chart then extends to the division as well, and because then the division then is the one that appointed certain companies for certain activities in that contract. Same applies to slide number nine. I'm, I'm looking at the... I was worried, thinking the, a lot of officials that are leaving. Slide number nine. Uh, yes, Chairperson, I think the people that will be involved today would be the Chairperson of the board as well as then the GCEO of the time. Okay. This is, this is a, a 2015, uh, this is a 2016 contract. All right. Also, it's not a whole lot of officials, just... Richard, yes, uh, certain contracts were, were not even tabled, um, uh, you know, for, for both consideration. They would then be um, uh, uh, agreed to between the group CEO and, and, and the service providers, then it will just be a report then that will be tabled afterwards. And, and, and for, uh, slide 14 as well. I was looking at people that have left. It's 
slide 14, Chairperson, we managed to track two of the people that were involved. Yes, I'm saying it says all implicated have left um, except for one. And then there's one who is now uh, working for another state-owned entity. Yes. But it also says there, is that slide 14? Yeah, slide 14. And then it also says referred evidence pointing to the commission of criminal offence against seven former members of the Tenel group on the right-hand side under criminal referral. It then speaks of seven. The criminal, yes, we, we covered all seven that were involved in this contract and also the, the MOAs. But then in terms of DCs, we could only track two um, who are currently working for the, the two uh, SOEs. Sure. And the one who is now a CEO who's demanding the IPs, Sorry, sorry, I didn't get that one. Uh, the, there's the, the one that you spend most time on, of missiles. Slide 27, second bullet from the bottom, on slide 27 in the middle. Missiles, is mm -hmm. yes. 27. Um, uh, obviously, the people who were involved, especially those that were representing Tenel as shareholder representatives, and the board of TD, they've left and they are also working for companies in the UAE. And, and, and the one who's, who's demanding the IP now? The one who's demanding the IP? Is also, he's now working for the UAE. Uh, she's, he's the CEO of NEMA. Okay. okay. Do, do, do you know how, how long were these people employed with Denel? I mean, uh, they are service um, with internal. Yes. The one who is now the CEO of SIMA is one person who was um, who then ended up with them. Remember when Denel acquired BAE system, the company acquired BAE system as well as then its employees, and this is the member who was then the former employee of BAE systems. And then, then after then the conclusion of this contract, this person then shortly after that then resigned and then went abroad to work for the, the same company. That was the, that one. Then the others in terms of then the, 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 the UAE TD um, matters, they were like long, member officials that served Denel through, through uh, different ranks who grew up within Denel and, and then... Uh, Post-94. I mean, pre-94, sorry. Uh, I would assume, but I will have to check their employment contracts. I don't want to just say yes. Um, Let's get in writing the full detail and profile of these persons when they were there, the roles they held. Yeah. Um, because typically some of them are obviously throwing themselves the javelin. Yes. Create contracts here, once they are sorted, leave and go and catch it on the other side for financial gain. Yeah. I think let's get a full set of briefings yes. in terms of who's who, because there's varying levels of persons yeah. in different spaces. No, no, thanks, Chair, because um, I was just thinking, hey, are these people, were they deliberate in sabotaging Danel to ensure its total collapse? And that will give us a sense uh, their service record in, in Denel. They've been doing this for, for, for quite some time. Sometimes, sometimes we tend to crucify the wrong Jesus and, and, and put the blame on the board. And there's systematic sabotage for those that have been there uh, during apartheid days, now that um, things have changed. They, they cannot accept the change. They are hell-bent in destroying the state-owned entities. But I think the, that that information, Chair, will assist to look into the, the trend. Perhaps even the SIU when conducting those investigations, you might um, assist so that we see the trend and understand the, the intention and the root cause of this uh, uh, when we also get a vetting status of these people, we may not necessarily delve into, we don't want the details of, but they, are they vetted and, or not? Do they have clearance or not? 
because we are seemingly having a problem, and we've raised it with the Minister and the Presidency as well and prior, there's a Cabinet Resolution of 2014. Persons in SCM specifically must be vetted. It's moving at a snail pace. And so you've got people in very sensitive spaces and financial management who are not vetted. And it, it, it lands us in this kind of, of dilemma um, which currently prevails. Right, Honorable Hattab, as you conclude. Yes, yeah, because uh, I'm thinking, are, are these companies and uh, these state-owned entities that absorb these people aware of these outstanding charges against these individuals? I mean, I don't know uh, if, if it was me, I wouldn't be comfortable in employing a person who, who's, a, who's having a dark cloud um, around. So uh, upon realizing that Beggy now is part of this new state-owned entity, um, whose responsibility it is to inform the, 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 the company to say, hey, this person is having uh, uh, this track record um, and on what basis was he employed? Uh, that type of um, uh, arrangement, um, who, who's, who's, is it a must or it's not the responsibility of Daniel to do such? Chairperson, um, if I may respond, we, as, as we uncovered uh, evidence of misconduct, we referred a file, a disciplinary file, to both Daniel and SAA for the disciplinary process. So one is at Denel, one is at SAA, and then we are requested the institution to institute disciplinary processes. Maybe the question then becomes the one that went to Denel. Has Denel instituted the disciplinary processes? Because there's this revolving door problem in the public service, one, two, there's no coordination or integration of systems. So on the eve of a DC, as we've seen people resign. So SIU says they've advised. Has the individual who left from SAA to come to Denel undergone any disciplinary processes? There's, there's one group chief executive who left uh, NAMPEC and went to, and we were warned, we did not yeah, take. NAMPEC is not a state. <laughs> <laughs> can we focus on, can we focus on no, no, I'm specifically just, I'm, the state-to-state? I'm, I'm, state. I'm, I'm raising an issue that, you see, when you left an institution um, under certain conditions and alarm bells have been Yeah, ranked, but I'm yeah. saying that for the purposes of this discussion, there's an individual who left SAA and went to Denel. And SIU? No, Chairperson. There are two that were part of the, the house contract. One was one is working for SAA, and one is working for Denel. So what we did, we referred a DC to SAA, and copied Denel as well as the minister. And then for the one at Denel, we then sent a DC to the chairperson of the board and copied the minister. So as I'm asking, Uchi, what happened, happened to that one referred to Denel? We we're on the same page. I'm asking that one. There's one that was referred to Denel. When we deal with SAA. We'll get to that one, but what happened to this one? So, uh, Chairman, uh, she's right. Uh, they referred the file to us. Is it a week ago now? But about two weeks ago. So we've got those files, very thick files, um, which the board has to apply its mind to that. It's one of these many contracts. It's a VR laser one. And um, the, the ex-CEO is in Denel as a contractor for, for uh, part of the restructuring. So with that file now that we've got from SIU, this board is now going to apply it months to that and come back uh, to SIU in terms of uh, what we do. What is severe here, Chairman, is, is, is the 
is the level of, of the systemic uh, theme, which is why I was saying, on the one hand, we have to deal with the UAE because it's a market we need to deal with. At the same time, that is where we lost most things, mm -hmm. IP and people. Um, there is over 300 Denel employees who are in UAE at this point, and pretty much from the same area of missiles. So it's quite a, a severe concentration of, of, of people who have gone there, and they didn't go at the same time. They went in piecemeal, largely because, yeah, looks like they had to work together and do something. So we have to carefully look at that, deal with that, and at the same time, walk this fine line of dealing with UAE, the country, uh, and, and, and do the right. We still have a joint venture there that still has to do business. Uh, <laughs> so we, we're quite, we, we're walking like, I don't want to say ducks, but we... No, the diplomatic considerations yes, must apply. Yes, 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 yes. But so on this one of the VR laser, it's a simpler and it's an easier one because we now have the referral. We have now have the file as a board and we are going to uh, apply our minds to that and we'll sit with SIU as to how we see that going forward. Uh, the, the, the nuance there uh, for advocate is that the person is not an employee either, is contracted. So there's going to be a wedding there around that legal wedding in terms of what we do if we do find that we have to do something. It may not be the disciplinary hearing. It may be something else which shows proximity though that he's with us even though he's a contractor and not as a full-time employee. Thanks. Just one DM. No, I also wanted just to punctuate by saying, as we go through the reports, the minister has already taken some steps, and he said I could say it here, that he has got a list of people that he has referred back to SIU two, three weeks ago, which they still have to look at, for them to be declared as delinquent so that going forward, they no longer have any opportunity of saving anywhere. Uh, and it's a group of them, so we are also trying to now begin to, to respond to that. But it's still at that stages of back to and sensitive and, yeah. So the list is there, but we will not be able to say who are the people. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, those that went abroad, are they clean? They, uh are they clean in terms of they are not disciplinary cases? Uh, the 300 that you mentioned. Based on the, the current, report, when we yeah. finally have the, it will be a combination of clean, not clean. In the sense that. In terms of balance of probabilities. Okay. You're looking at what, what percentage. Okay. Uh, but I would know if that. you don't have that information, but it's fine. I would know that, but the 300 is a little bit too big mm. to have been in this scheme necessarily. So you'll find that most of those now are pure skills which have left and followed the leaders of the commotion, if I were to call it that. And you can fault people need opportunities, dollar salaries and so on, they allude into there, but that's because there's a there's a second point that actually get them there. But I wouldn't know the balance of the numbers, but it's a lot of people uh, in that sense. Let's allow the process to run its course and then we will look at that report at that Point. There's one final thing I want to raise, Madam Chair, when you're speaking about the AFS, as you said that you had to get help from outside. 
Can you unpack that? You're speaking about consultants. Oh, what is the nature of that and the costs involved and as to whether there is any skills transfer? It's just one last thing that I flagged here. It involves costs, uh, Chairman, for the following reasons, that uh, for a while we had the salary issues, but an accounting firm can come and do the work because they are not dependent on your salary, uh, but they will be paid to do the work. Some firms do this, I mean, what do you call it, Tandega? They, they bring a team to fill the gaps and do the work. So yes, we have them internally, and that makes a big difference in terms of the capacity. The intention is to replace them with permanent employees now that we can pay salaries. So that's the... At what cost are they there? It's actually not a, it's not a big cost. I don't know if you have the numbers. It's, it's a number that the board is comfortable with in the sense that if we had those employees working inside, we'll probably be paying more or less the same. Uh, but what does that cost, Um, The cost was um, circa 10 million. For the three, for 10 million. Well, a period of how long? Um, they began in, um, uh, I think it was September 2022 to date, and they'll continue to provide support for the audit uh, until at, at the end, um, until November, when the audit is potentially expected to finalize. I think maybe to just to add on to what the chair is saying, the, the skill set that was given is quite, quite broad. If I can just give context, when um, in 2016 in finance we had set up about uh, 200 employees for, across finance for all of the divisions, um, as we sit, we're sitting with permanent employees of about 60 employees. Um, so there's been quite a reduction of employees in Denela over the years as well as providing the technical skills, because as you recall, we received a disclaimer, audit opinion in 2020, some of it was technical, um, in terms of implementing the standards uh, for revenue and, 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 and other elements. So it's a mixture of hands and technical expertise that we needed to bring in to assist us then to table for the financials for the three years. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, what is the process of filling the vacancies in the board? When you started, you said it's 13 or 12 members, and you spoke about two. It's coming to my head because if you're outsourcing to agencies and then you're trying to explain it, on the other hand, me and him were just talking, for example, you say you have got three committees. I'm already asking myself the numbers. How many in the subcommittees of the board? How many are you? you know, all the, the logistics of just stabilizing the board. I hope I'm hearing your question. Uh, My question to the minister is, the board is supposed to be a fully fleshed board. People have resigned. The board only requested for two people to make it eight. What is hindering you from ensuring that you've got a full number of board members? I mean, dear. I think, well, this, this, I, th I think it was explained earlier, minimum is three, and the maximum is 13. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, you can go for any number in between. Uh, based on also skills that are needed, what are the skills at that particular point in time for the composition? And the board then came and said, we needed two for now, right? based on what is happening inside the, in the board. And hence, we then granted them the two. Uh, but the board will then have to do that assessment and say, do they want full or they are fine the way they are, but they were not fine with six. That's why they came back and say, we need certain skills gaps that are there in the board and we'll need so. And then when you look to finance, they are highly equipped. I think it's three CAs in the board, uh, just to look at the financial element. But as we heard, there were 200 staff members 
uh, across all the six divisions uh, in the group that were dealing with the finances. They are left with 60. And the gap of 140 people gone. So we then they had to then get this company temporarily to come in, stabilize the financial situation, and with the view that as they, we are now beginning to concentrate on the building, the management will also have to look at ensuring that the employment, it might not be 200 again, but at least we need additional capacity than the, than the, the, the 60 that they have now to ensure therefore that on the financial aspects of things, and as you reduce the structure of the, from six divisions now to four, what will be the sizable number that can then qualify and the skills that are going to be? It's a bit, oh no, something is falling from the ceiling uh, because of Move rain. yourselves that way, the same concrete. <laughs> yeah. All right. <clears throat> uh, my office is flooded now, I don't have an office, so <coughs> I'm, ceiling, I'm sitting. Move this way. Yeah. We're almost done in any case. Yeah, this building is old. <coughs> yeah, but so, also this so, so was a courtyard. Therefore, so this that, was a courtyard, and so yeah. this is a new, and it created a, oh, yeah, I could a chamber. You. It was a courtyard here. It was a courtyard, yeah. you can it's see. Not an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> this is not no an earthquake. No earthquake just yet. <laughs> so, uh, and I think, therefore, the board must then re examine itself once more to say, do they need additional people? And if so, let it be, and I don't. The 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 the, the constitution does allow up to 30, 13. So let the, let let it be, but it must be based on those skills, both productions, engineering, finance. But on the finance in the board, I think they are adequate, uh, very very adequate. So now we are still looking at other because also the the industry is changing, uh, and we want to fill in people now and uh, the art artificial intelligence is coming in, robotics is coming in. So we might then also have then to create, leave that space for that. As I was engaging the minister and say, our industry is still not technologically advanced. So we might then have to also to begin to look at the board as terms of bringing that capacity and the skills so that as the management also begin to employ in their divisions to then look at futuristic elements, because robotics is going to be uh, the future. I think right. AI is the future, and also the, 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 what is this thing that flies on air? Okay. Uh, drones are going to be the future. And we right. may find that then the space that is left in the port is good for us to be able then to go into the future elements. Thank All right, no, thank you very much. All right, briefly, please. No, I'm, I'm requesting that we be finished with the, the, the terms of reference for the composition of board committees. Yeah, because that will give us a sense whether or not you are understaffed or, or not. No, no, I'm saying the composition, you've got three committees in your board. So how is it constituted? How many members each committee is supposed to have? Uh, external and internal, including money, so that we can see whether or not the six is enough. I, I think you've got six members. How are they spread across the three committees? Yeah, but it, the, the, that and spread, the other that spread it's it's not dependent on what you have. Each committee must have its own terms of reference. That this committee is required to have so many external, so many internal, for the decision to be uh, based on outside people instead of. A decision. You can have a committee where you have a lot of executive uh, overpowering the the, the, the uh, non-executive directors. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, okay. Have you captured him correctly so that there's no ambiguity when the response comes? I think that's where the chair was going. She wanted to understand you so that the response in writing could be. So as long as she's fine on that. Uh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, Thanks. you're fine. So maybe just as I said, and also members should also know that this organization was at ground zero, were in the rebuilding phases. <laughs> yeah, so and in the rebuilding, both in the management and staff and also in the board, is the same situation that we are building block by block. Thank you.
All right. Now I want to um, thank you colleagues and the colleagues that have had to leave. We were somewhat depleted because some other colleagues are in Kimberley for the memorial of our late colleague, uh, the late Honorable Tina Jumat peterson um, I want to thank the DM and the Chair of the Board and the Board members, Babum Tib and your team and the executives uh, of uh, Denau. Really, in essence, the conclusion is that the purpose of today was to be able to transition all of us with you towards us receiving the annual reports and audited financial statements, to be in a position to understand the work that has happened, so that when we engage with the reports when they come, we are somewhat on the same, same page. So I think you have taken us on board in many material respects in terms of the work that you have done and that when the audit is concluded, it will make um, fundamental sense uh, to us. And of course, then on the basis of whatever the audit outcome is, we will then schedule another uh, hearing. But it was important for us to be up to speed in terms of developments, progress, or lack thereof, challenges, and so on. Um, and so I think that in large parts you have achieved that, and we've got a sense from when we last met uh, we, it, we, 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 to take us on, on, on board. Um, I will conclude by saying that obviously there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and I think um, there are areas of concern for us. Amongst them is uh, stabilizing leadership uh, at Denel, and I think that the timelines have to be clarified concretely, um, and the consequence management uh, has to form a key, uh, you know, aspect of what you do moving forward uh, to give us confidence that the, the mistakes and challenges of the past and the corruption of the past will not repeat itself. It's part of the rebuilding process from ground zero. Instilling a culture of consequence management as a norm um, at the um, en entity. The other issues which we require in writing in their many material facets, including the timeline towards the CEO, the issues that Honorable Hatebe has raised now around the construct of the board committees and so on. Um, the 10 million rands breakdown in the terms of reference of this company that's there. We take a dim view generally on consultants in the space of annual financial statements simply because we have not gotten a sense that they provide skills transfer. Sometimes they come in and the audit outcome is still adverse or questionable or problematic. So we understand that in this instance something has got to give given the brain drain that uh, you have suffered, and we accept it as an exception. But why we probe it is if municipalities can spend over one billion rands in total to bring in consultants and you still have the kind of audit outcomes that you have, we worry about the quality of external people coming in as to whether they are achieving what it is that we require. So Honorable Hatteb in his cocktail life, he will tell you the frustration they have with consultants. One, over 1.1 billion rands spent on consultants. And then you look at the quality of statements and they already realize what these people are just there for that. So that's why we would sort of look at it to say, do we not fall into the same trap? So with that, colleagues, I'd like to thank you very much. Colleagues, we are on oversight next week. Lungisa, please remind members we are on ESCOM related matters. National Treasury and Road Accident Fund. So a full week in Johannesburg. And then there's a tentative meeting on prasa related matters on the 4th and 5th of July, once we get permission from the House Chairperson during the recess period. There's urgent matters on the Philippi issues and prasa City of Cape Town, Western Cape Provincial Government, and some over 100 million rands given to the HDA, so it can't wait for us to resume Parliament schedule. So, tentatively, all of you in your diaries, please, 4 and 5 July, we are in Cape Town. On that note, DM, I'd like to thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, DM, the question on costs.
comes back to you as the department in light of what the chairperson has said. So okay, it, it's not off the table. Um, something's got to give um, because, and I really would want to implore you that there's a timeless communication of co correspondence from our side and to your entities. Otherwise, as I'm saying, the boards come in the firing line and they bear the brutal brunt of whatever is the consequence and outcome of our discomfort. So, DPE, shape up, please. Please. The meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>